buying billions and billions of dollars of products, agricultural products. Obviously, the first step was on December 15th when we did not go ahead and raise additional tariffs on this front. Uh, but people have still been wondering kind of what happens. Where is the deal? What, what are the terms of those deals? How can we follow through on some of these things? But again, watching the moves that China is making over the weekend does answer some of the questions they brought up before about what happens. Right. How does this not violate WTO, which, of course, always seemed a little rich at the time. Now they're concerned about violating WTO. Um, but we'll see what happens with it. Meantime, I don't, I don't know what everyone's view of this one is. Uh, former Travis, uh, former former Travis, yeah. former CEO of Uber, Travis Kalanick, has now sold more than two point five billion dollars worth of his shares since a lockup period expired just last month. That leaves him now with less than ten percent of his holdings left and puts him on pace to be completely divested within days. His remaining stake is worth about two hundred fifty million dollars. He's still a member of Uber's board. Kalanick has been working on his new venture. Cloud Kitchens, which has been buying real estate around the world in a bet that restaurants will ultimately pay rent capacity to create food for delivery. But this is a is this is an indictment, I think, of Uber yeah. in terms of in terms of Kravis's view of the future of the company, or is it something else? To, to quote Jim Cramer, sell, sell, sell. <laughs> sell, sell, sell. He's the smart money. Nobody on earth knows more about Uber than Travis Cowan. He's on the board. He, he's he on has, the board. He has he built, the information. He the business. He knows the competitors. He, I mean, this is a very, very smart money. Okay, but could it be either some frustration, frustration with the direction of the company that he just dis disagrees with may not be wrong. Well, not and to or, the company was not very nice to him when they were going out with the IP. Right. That was my question. Him, yeah. Is, yeah. is, is it really an games. indictment of Uber or is it just say something about the relationship? Uh, the the relationship, relationship yeah, I just went out. so sour. Yeah. I, this guy cares deeply about his own personal net worth. The first time I met him, uh, he, he told me how much that Ooh. personal net worth was. Okay. But I also so think I he's don't think he's to making... be able to control it. The idea of handing over control to somebody else to be able to run his money, if he can take it out and invest it in a project where he actually has hands-on experience, because even though he's on the board, I don't think he gets much of a say in what happens in the company at this point and disagrees with uh, Derek Ashwashawi, where where things are headed as well. Things have been so frayed. I, I, I thought it was a poor form that they didn't allow him to stand on the dais at the New York Stock Exchange the day that they went public. He was yeah, it was very father. petty. Yeah, it was. Wait, so, you, so we think there's a personal personality I, I don't clash? I don't know. Or, or I don't does have he actually need money to, to raise money for his new project? Right. And, and I, I see him as being the type. I see I him as being the type. Of you, no, but I see really him as being the type of person who would like to run his own money. He doesn't seem like somebody who is a passive sort of investor or somebody who likes to say, "Okay, you run the show, and I'll and I'll figure it out." It seems to me that he would want to be more in control of his destiny. I, but aren't you both right? It, Isn't it also a personality clash? Okay. I mean, every, every time Let Andrew, I've seen you ask Dara, yeah, uh, and I've asked Dara. The answer you get back isn't an emphatic, you know, yeah, yeah we're, we love we're, each other. we're besties it's and a strange we're relationship movies together. Sure. Right. No, hundred percent. Going to movies together. Speaking of Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker brought in $176 million in North America in its debut weekend. That was enough to top the box office here, but it is the smallest haul of the new Star Wars trilogy. The movie was hit with pretty harsh reviews and a 57% rotten score on Rotten Tomatoes. More, most of the time, I don't care what the critics say. Rotten Tomatoes, I pay a little more attention to, but it's not going to stop me from going to see this movie. What did the Quickwell family think? Well, we're not, we're oh, not, you didn't see We're going to see it. I think part of it is, look, it came out, and the way the holiday falls this year, okay. you know, I, I'm going to see it with the entire family uh, over I, I Christmas. I thought the whole gang was now, already My brothers, their wives, in. my parents. It's a my, big to-do. My son already saw it, and when? he said it's way better than what... Rotten Tomatoes said. See, and I, I, I tend to think that that's probably the case. Most people I've talked to who have seen it have said the same thing. If you're a Star Wars fanatic, right? You're not if you're a fan, fan, and he yeah. said it's better than the previous film. So I think if you're a fan, you're going. And and I know that we're all saying, oh, this is the first under two hundred million dollar opening. But let's, I mean, let's be real. I mean, it's one hundred and seventy six million dollars versus Cats at. Six and a half million dollars. <laughs> the Farley family contributed Did you see sixty dollars to cash. Oh, okay, hold on. Stop. Stop. Stop the show. <laughs> what happened? Tell us. Give us a review so, of cats. So let me let me be clear. Yep. It was not three members of the Farley family. Okay, and you saw the and not me the pre the the early 
view before they've updated, before they've updated the, the right. digital changes or whatever they're trying Which to is do. Crazy. The yes. review was scathing. Right. So it was a yes. big movie weekend. Scathing Frozen from the Farley 2, family. From the Farley family. Frozen two on Saturday. They said it was actually quite good. Good music. Good plot. Not as good as Frozen. Okay, but Tom one, Farley's but not good. participating in either of these films. Dear God, no. Okay. Uh, and then Cats on Sunday. Kids hated it. They said Taylor. First of all, it was confusing. What, even, what, even what are the ages? Uh, Fourteen and eleven. Okay. All girls. Okay. And they said it was confusing and and most damning. Taylor Swift was only in the movie for one short song. Was how bait it was and switch. described to me. A little bit of a ba- little bit of a bait and switch. Well, the fact is they're now putting in a new film. I mean, they're actually replacing the film. I've never heard of that ever yeah. after the release date. Right. I've but never I think heard there's a, I think there's a lot of people like us. We actually we had our big family movie date this weekend, and we had bought in advance. We had bought the cats tickets. The reviews came out, and we returned the tickets. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to see Frozen Two instead, and it was great. Did, did, can I ask a question? And why does as a as a business person, I'm reading about Disney and and Star Wars and Frozen Two. Why didn't they space out some of these movies? You know, that, you know, has, t- been, that has been the way with the, with the studio lately. They have all of these releases that come out so fast that I end up missing some of them because I don't get to the movie theaters that often, even and, with the kids. In 2020, their yeah. lineup is Well, is and that was part of the full. problem with the last one that they put out, the Han Solo movie that they put out. It came out in the middle of the cycle because they used to wait a year for all of these things. That one came out in the middle of the cycle in the middle of the year, and it didn't do well as a result. So, yeah, yeah there, there, there is a saturation point, I think, and they've tested right up against those limits. Okay, a lot more to come this morning. On the, can we call this like a holiday edition of Squawk Box? Can we do that all week? Holiday edition. Well, I like the poinsettias that they put in. Can we get some shots of the poinsettias? Very Make nice. sure everyone appreciates the full holiday spirit. Okay, coming up when we return. By the way, happy Hanukkah, everybody. That was last night for us. Uh, the Fed, and we, we do Christmas too. We're Christmas loving Jews. Uh, the Fed was one of President uh, Trump's favorite punching bags in 2019. We'll talk about what to expect from the central bank in the new year. Right after the break. Take a look at U.S. equity futures right now. We've got some green on the screen to match our red ties for this holiday season. Back in a moment. Was last night the first day? Today's big number 5,175%. That's how much Patrick Industries is up over the past decade making it the top-performing stock in the S&P 1500 during that period. Leave a mince pie out for Santa this Christmas and you might find the whole pack disappears. At Asda, our extra special luxury mince pies are just £1.39 and our extra special slow gin mince pies are only £2. Well, Santa might like to try something different. Asda, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores subject to availability, six pies per pack. Ho, 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 who's made a list this year? I want a new phone, one with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through. Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus. Offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on Tune In. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your Tune In Premium membership, you already have an all access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards at the goal line, it's intercepted. Listen live as the action unfolds or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Search NFL today. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut to The sideline, the man fleet for three. Tune in Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now, hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane, turn around, jumper from eight feet is good on Search the right NBA block. today to start listening. Ah, finally another commercial, said no one ever. 
Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade now and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. The economy and the Fed were a big focus for the markets in 2019. The Fed particularly was a big target, of course, for President Trump. I want to show you Steve Leisman with a look at what to expect in 2020 on that front. Nothing is more central to the outlook in 2020 than what happens to the trade war. It looks to have depressed growth here at home and around the world this year. It led the Federal Reserve to reverse course and cut rates sharply in 2019. Here's what to look out for in 2020. First, the trade war should improve somewhat, or at least not get worse. As the year drew to a close, that seemed to be the case already with the announcement of a limited U.S.-China phase one deal. Uncertainties will remain, but business will learn to invest and prosper in a world with a constant rumbling of trade disputes. Second, assuming a lot of damage hasn't already been done, that should help to lead to improved global growth. That could help lift U.S. growth towards 2.5% in 2020, or a half point above where it likely closed out in 2019. But third, the Federal Reserve should remain on hold while much of this plays out. It could consider raising rates if global growth also firms global inflation and other central banks start to hike. And markets uh, closing last week at record highs once again. So how should investors uh, be riding the rally? And how do they set themselves up uh, for the next year? Joining us right now to talk strategy for the holiday week ahead is Kevin uh, Mann, president and CIO at Henny and, and at Walsh Asset Management. Good morning to you. Good morning. Okay, so we've got a week and a half to go. Yep. There's a couple things going on here. I want to talk about the technical factors that go into this. I mean, we have a nice, it feels like another, like a little rally right into we'll, Christmas. We'll like and then close up. I don't know if you think that also rides into the new year, but... There's always this view that people are going to sell. There's sort of tax harvesting things. There's that point at which certain funds want to be in certain names so they can show it on the disclosure yep. forms next year. Yep. How does that play itself out over the next, say, seven to ten days? Sure. I, I think there's two fears I want to talk about. One is the fear of recession, and the other is the fear of missing out. Most of 2019, there was a fear of recession. We saw the two and the ten-year invert. We saw the Fed cut three times. We were concerns about global growth slowing. Now, all of a sudden, we've seen that the market continues to hit record highs. We have a phase one of the trade agreement. In the last six weeks, we see $43 billion go into equity funds. So I think investors are now trying to play catch-up, and it's that momentum that's going to push stocks a little bit higher for the balance of this year and into the first quarter. Okay, but what does the first quarter look like? Because that's that, my fear is a different fear. Yeah. My fear is that, it's that we have a nice little run, and January is softer. I think what you're going to see in the and first quarter— And that's a polite way to put it. —is strong fourth quarter earnings— more validation that the consumer is still strong and still spending, and likely record holiday sales, which is going to push the consumer discretionary sector higher, particularly e-commerce. That's one area that we like going into the first and, quarter. And what about forecast earnings? What do you think we'll see? Because right now, the, the forward PE is only 17 and a half, 18 times with a 1.9% 10-year yield. Feels normal, could even go up, but is it possible earnings will come down? I think it's possible earnings will come down, but now for the first half of the year, we're going to see the momentum continue. We have a 50-year low for the unemployment rate. Wages have risen 3.1% over the last year. Inflation's around 1.8%, 1.9%. That feels pretty good. That means there's more disposable income, and if consumers are working, they're going to continue spending. Is there anything that would happen that would shake your confidence? I guess if the phase one of the trade agreement really doesn't happen, uh, if the Federal Reserve starts to do things we're not expecting, um, but after the second quarter, every, all eyes are going to start focusing on that November 2020 election and who's going to be in the White House and who's going to be controlling Congress. You think FOMO is playing out right now, that fear of missing out? Or do you think it's something where people are still waiting to see if the, you know, the carpet gets yanked out from under them on the trade agreement and you think that you'd really see a big push higher next year? I don't think you're going to see a big push higher. I still think we're in that 6 to 8% upside yeah. potential next right. year, and that's going to really be during the first two quarters of the year, and then investors are going to sit on their hands until they know what happens. Okay, so I have an a election Fed question. Sure. Do you think in an election year, Jay Powell is, is, it wants to do anything? I mean, don't work. you think that the whole strategy of, of saying what he said at the end of this year was to say, look, hands off the wheel for the next year, you guys just have at it. Yeah, I think that's a large part of it. Right. But then also with earnings continue to grow, at least for the first two quarters of next year, I don't think the Fed does But you anything. think if, if things get either 
worse than expected or better than expected? Do you think he puts his hands back on the wheel I think in an election year? Worse than expected. That's why we had the insurance cuts last year. I don't anticipate getting that better, that inflation's going right. to really start to ramp up. That does nothing in 2020. I have an election question. So uh, predicted has Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren about a 20% chance that one of them wins the presidency. So if we're sitting here in March and it looks like they're not only going to win the nomination, good chance they're going to win the presidency, what does that mean for markets? It's a long way off. I think we really have to wait till June, July. We'll see what the conventions are, uh, who the candidate is. Uh, but a lot of that will be priced into the markets as we get closer to that point in time. And I think for the first half of the year, not knowing who the Democratic contender is going to be, we're going to be riding the strength of the economy. Okay. Kevin, great to see you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you. All right, coming up, a public service for all you. Really, how does Royal Caribbean become? As Boris Johnson prepares to lead Britain through Brexit, save 50% on intelligent insight and expert analysis from the team that knows him best. Treat yourself to a standard digital subscription with The Telegraph today for just £1 per week for your first three months. Visit telegraph.co.uk forward slash half price. Ho, 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 who's made a list this year? I want a new phone, one with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through? Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G-ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus, offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th, 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. What better way to celebrate the holidays than with a subscription to TuneIn Premium? With a bottomless library of the world's best audio, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Search Premium to upgrade today. Hi, I'm Tom Haberstroh, host of the Haberstroh Podcast. I'm partnering with TuneIn to answer a few questions and get you prepped for NBA Christmas Day. All right, the NBA game I'm most looking forward to is, man, it's got to be Lakers Clippers. A clash of West Titans, LeBron and AD, Kawhi and Paul George, LA versus LA. Both teams will be rested and at home, so no load management talk. This is going to be a great one. Search The Haber Show to listen to new episodes every Friday throughout the NBA season on TuneIn. Far wing, elevates, triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut it. The sideline, the man fleet for three. Tune in Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now. Hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane. Turn around. Jumper from eight feet is good on Search the right Search NBA today to start listening. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. With 2020 on the horizon, TuneIn continues looking back at the stories that shaped the 2010s. In 2012, Black Lives Matter is born after the killing of an unarmed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. In 2015, the European refugee crisis sees an, an unprecedented number of asylum seekers entering the EU after fleeing conflict regions like Syria. And in 2017, the Me Too movement inspires a new wave of social justice. Search news on TuneIn to be listening when the next decade Decades big headlines break. Looks, packs his own, goes in the end zone, touchdown underneath the crossbar. NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. Tonight, TuneIn has your Monday night NFL football with the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Kickoff at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Throws up, dart toward the end zone, caught, ball, caught, ball, touchdown with a touchdown of the left quarter. Bucks take the lead. Fire at home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade.
items for the holiday season that you can still pick up before Christmas if you hurry. Joining us, joining us right now is Lori Bergamato. She is Good Housekeeping Style Director. And Lori, thanks for being here this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Right, so you, you have brought us some pretty interesting, <laughs> unique gifts, toys almost to a certain extent, but things that uh, most kids would like having in their stocking stuffers and some adults too. Some adults, definitely. And last minute doesn't have to mean you have to be lazy and only get a gift card, right? Mm -hmm. There are some really good options. We're going to start with for the beauty <laughs> junkies in your life. Andrew, will you be my model for this? 100 percent okay so here we go this is how this you is, turn it on okay, turn this on is this is a laser thing that's gonna make my skin beautiful oh, you already have beautiful skin Thank you. this is from dr dennis gross it is the spectral like eyes face wide mask. Shut. a little spooky <laughs> So you press it one more time. Okay, here we go. There we go. Oh. So you can see it's lighting up, right? That's LED light, red and blue light. It helps to Hello, stimulate everybody. circulation. Little, my kids. You look can like someone Jason. call them and wake them up to make sure they're watching this <laughs> right now? So you can pick this up at Nordstrom stores. It's around $430. And it really That's replaces... Pretty, it's, it's pricey. Does it really work? It really does work. I was We were just talking about this in the makeup room because everybody's like, I've seen this. Does it really work? It really, really works. What, it, it prevents acne. It kills the So it the can bacteria. prevent acne. Acne, that's what the blue light does. And then the right. red light helps to fight wrinkles. It promotes blood circulation. It improves your complexion. This had over 97% of the people who used it show a significant improvement. We and how long am I supposed to keep it on my face for? So like it will, the show. three minutes. You can take it off now. No, no, but I'm just, <laughs> no, no. I want to get the benefit you of it. You want to get the benefit? It's only three minutes. Okay. Three you, minutes? Three minutes. And it will shut off by itself. Yeah. And I do it for three minutes every day? We've got some every day. And I just hold it to my face like this. So you can pick that up at Nordstrom. So that's really easy. Move to the next one. If it's okay, Lauren, can I just ask? Yeah. Do you have one of these? I want one of those. Okay, you do. <laughs> this is on your wish list. It is on my wish list, and I've used it before. We have it in the Good Housekeeping Institute in the Beauty Lab, yeah. and it really—it's amazing. It comes with a little head strap that I didn't right. bring because I didn't. So it can hold. So it can hold on to my head. Okay. You know, and you can multitask while you're doing it. Got Three it. minutes. I hope I haven't got any makeup on here. <laughs> That's okay. okay. If you do, you'll just have to keep it. We'll so this is, these are just lasers. They're little LED lights. Oh, LED. They're not lasers. Okay. No, it's light therapy, and it replaces going to the dermatologist's office to get that light therapy, which huh. is extremely expensive, and it's more convenient to just do it. Home. That's the blue light. All right, okay. what's next on your list? Okay, so next, I want to move to this Hyper Ice Hyper. This Volt is the one I want. Because Andrew was so excited about it, right? Okay, so you guys must hear a lot about this when people are working out, they have sore muscles. This is like a massager. Put so it higher have, so people can see it. Okay, they, we, where right. am I? Which there you go, right bingo. Okay. Right. So we're going to turn it on. Okay, Andrew, will you be my model one more time I, here? I will. Okay, so, so this is available I'm at Bloomingdale's. I'm massaging my arms, there and you, you can go. hear it in my voice. And it has max power and torque. You can, you can even torque. press the torque. That's like the force of right. movement, right? Is this high or low? So that's low. So I was just going to say, if you press that black button in the back, it can even move the speed setting up. It comes with multiple different attachments, right. which I'll hold up here. So nice. It's so nice. It's great the for athletes, that, anybody who has sore muscles. The thing to note is you how, have quiet, how quiet it is because the really competitor quiet. to this yes. is the, it's the it's loudest so thing. The competitor one is more expensive. Yeah. yeah. And how it'll give you a, it'll give you a headache. It'll give you a headache. Uh, so, Theragun? Theragun. Theragun. Except it apparently has a better handle. This yeah, I've read a lot about these things. Yeah. But it's on sale right now. So if you go to Bloomingdale's, you can pick this up in their gift hub. Uh -huh. And it's really nice incredible. Right I was actually there at Bloomingdale's yesterday and there were four people ahead of me in line buying this. I saw a hot gift. I saw this. Before you set it up, I said, "Is that a sex toy?" Oh no, yeah, no, well. no, 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 no. Hey now. Yeah, uh. but that's a great thing to get for anybody in your life who's working out a lot, or even if you just have like sore. Mu I mean, don't we all are we, we like, do. stressed and have sore muscles? I so just went to Barry's thing. boot camp yesterday, so I'm going to. Uh, this I mean, is good right, right here. Let Andrew continue doing I'm that. The rest of the show. I'm so excited. Tell me what's next. Okay, so we're going to go to the Nintendo Switch light. I'm going to turn this on here. So you guys have probably heard about this, right? No. Yes? No? no. You guys have been here? Okay, so the Switch was a really hot Yeah, my gift. kids have the Switch. What's the Switch okay. light? Okay, the Switch light is obviously a little bit lighter. It's a little less expensive, and it's strictly for handheld. So you're not going to hook it up to different consoles. It comes in three different colors. I'm going to pass this. Do you want to pass yeah, this around? Yeah, absolutely. You guys can play it. This is like $199, right? It's $199, and you can get this at GameStop or other retailers. This has been one of those items that has really defined the gift season for 2019. Everybody wants this, whether you're a millennial, a Gen Xer, I've even seen some boomers picking this up. So it's a really fun thing. It's great for commuters because you can just play it handheld. You just play it's easy. I know Let's you want because I want to make sure we get to all five. Okay, so this is the Mr. Potato Head moving lips, mm -hmm. and let's make sure he's on. <laughs> So, which camera am I on? Oh, I want oh, I that. Love that. Already. I want that already. <laughs> you see this? And it's only 18 bucks. It's only it's 18 bucks. It's on Amazon. Really easy. One click away. This tested really well in our Good Housekeeping Toy Awards. I don't know if you guys want to... 
play with this one, but we can pass that one around too. Becky, if you want to Becky is that. literally I'm, going I'm, on, I'm on Amazon.com Amazon 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 as now, we as speak. That thing is great. In our Toy Test Awards, testers absolutely loved it, and parents really like it because it's so nostalgic. Potato head moving lips. Okay, show me the and show me the okay. last gift that we this have. This one's also sorry. Really cool. I love this. I'm I so want glad. This. I'm well, going to one, buy it right that now. That one maybe I can hook you up with Andrew. Okay, so this one is available at Best Buy. This is the Taito Care. Have you guys heard about this? Anybody no. at the nope. Taito Care? This is so cool. I love that you're playing with the Nintendo. Yeah, I'm sorry. You this lost. You lost, lost me. You lost me. I'm in a race here. It's like my children. Right here. So what this does, you're going to pair this with an app on your phone, okay. and it's an at-home medical whoops, an at-home medical device that okay. you're going to drop. It comes with a stethoscope, an otoscope, and essentially what it does is it can diagnose you over the phone. If you have insurance, certain insurance programs cover this. Wow. You call the doctor through the app. Okay. They see you through this video, and then wow. you can actually like, like FaceTiming them. Like FaceTiming them, but it uses the data. The Tito right. Home Care uses the data, so the physician is getting real time data. You're not just FaceTiming and saying, "Oh, my fever is 103, and I'm right. really ill." They're getting actual real time scientific this. data. Yes. This is your own physician who you're calling. So it's through. That's a great question. It's through a network that Tito Care provides, and it costs around fifty-five to sixty-five dollars depending on your health insurance. But it is a provider. It's a network provider. So you pay two fifty up front for the device. Correct. And then the app is if free. you want the appointment. Mm -hmm. The appointments are available at all different times. So there's always somebody available. And that's fifty bucks a pop. Around fifty five dollars depending I, on your insurance. As as Becky knows, I get I'm I'm a delicate flower and I get ill <laughs> and then I need to call the doctor because I'm dying or I feel like I am. Right. And then but so I wouldn't have to physically go to the doctor? No, you can do this from the comfort of your own home. You just turn it on. We can't do it here because of the Wi Fi firewall. If they if they can they prescribe medication? Yes. They and can. Go, and See, that's be. actually where the So, so I want to be clear, this does not diagnose, you know, heavy right. duty illnesses. Right. But if you have an ear infection, if you have a right. respiratory upper yes, this things is like, I feel like I'm really speaking uh, your you're language. You're speaking now. my language yeah, yeah. right now. So Andrew it comes with a stethoscope, comes with a tongue doctor. depressor. So Andrew, you, if you maybe had this is like if I would need ZPAC, basically. Exactly. That's what I'm. This I'm is talking the tongue about. depressor, just, and you basically you just plug it. You you know you stick it on here. You depress, and they can see everything in real time, right. and then the data gets sent right to them. Or you sold them. Can you yeah. come here this at least once a month? From Andrew, now on? any time. I feel like Andrew wanted everything. I don't know about oh, the rest of you. But I, 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 I want I that ordered. mask. No, for, I already yeah. ordered potatoes. That's why we were sitting. By the way, this men's skin, women's skin. It's not. Doesn't matter. I spent the whole weekend waiting at the store Glossier, the beauty yes. store. I couldn't get in Saturday. I couldn't get, get in Sunday to get makeup. Make I want, want that, that there for all, th for all three girls, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I can amortize the cost across three. Great. It's great. I'm telling you, everything here okay. people will love. There's happy, happy, happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays to you. Okay, Thank when you. we come back, a lot more on Squawk. Uh, SoftBank hitting a road bump in its bailout of WeWork. We've got details on that when Squawk returns right after this. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. As we play out the 2010s, tune in's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. Don't believe me, just watch. The 2010s saw the rise of the viral hit when meme-ready tracks like Gangnam Style, Open Gangnam Style, The Harlem Shake, The yeah. Harlem Shake, What Does the Fox Say, What Does the Fox Say, and of course, Old Town Road snowballed from internet oddities to global phenomenons. I got the horses in the bag. Keep listening to tune in for more trends of the 2010s. The Better Network is now on tune in. This is Brian Musburger. Search the Better Network. That's the B E T R Network. And then let us get you better prepared to better enjoy the day in sports. The NFL, college football, basketball, hockey, baseball. Sharpen your edge. The Better Network is now on tune in. Be better informed. Be better prepared. Search the Better Network. That's B E T R. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! 
Hand off Carruthers. Big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in. Touchdown. From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. With 2020 on the horizon, TuneIn continues looking back at the stories that shaped the 2010s. In 2011, Osama bin Laden is captured and killed by U.S. Special Forces after a decade-long manhunt. In 2016, Donald Trump is elected the 45th President of the United States after securing 304 electoral votes over Hillary Clinton's 227. And in 2018, a U.N. report stating the world has 12 years to prevent irreversible climate change. Search news on TuneIn to be listening when the next Next decade's big headlines break. We're live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Let's check out the U.S. equity futures at this hour. Green arrows once again. You're looking at all three of those major averages, which closed at new highs on Friday, adding to the gains this morning. In fact, right now, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ would open at new intraday trading highs. Dow's not quite there yet, but the Dow is indicated up by about 50 points. S&P futures up by four and a half, and the NASDAQ up by 18. What do you think, Tom? Kind of crashing into the end of the new year? I, uh, I was on with you a year ago. And so in Different preparing, in, pre- in, pre- <laughs> in preparing, I was looking back to my old notes. What I realized is the S and P today is up forty percent from where from, it was from when time. I was on the set, well, it bottomed, which was uh, December twenty first, I yeah, believe. We, we bottomed on Christmas Eve of last year, right? It's been straight up, kind of since then, right? Forty so percent. That's nuts, really. Yeah, forty percent. I think the Dow was at 23, 23.40 was the low, and today we're at wherever we, where are we now, 30, 32.51. If you do the math, it, it's uh, 30, 39 point something percent at these More levels. I even realize. It's staggering. Yeah, yeah, it is. All right, let's talk about some new details on Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg's trip to Washington, D.C. last week. According to the New York Times, FAA chief Stephen Dick- Dixon told Mullenberg not to ask for any favors and that Boeing should focus on providing all the documents needed to fully describe the 737 MAX software changes. The Times described the private meeting as tense. This was the first face-to-face encounter between those two men, but we have heard about the difficulties in that relationship. Um, Boeing thought that they were going to be on a timeline to actually get the 737 MAX approved by the end of this year. Uh, The new FAA chief thinks differently. He is not moving on Boeing's timeline on this and has been very outspoken about this. Honestly, in the longer term, it's probably for the best. There have been so many questions about what would happen if the FAA approved this, if the other global regulators would follow suit. And this is pretty strong signaling that they are not uh, in a cozy relationship and that this is not going to be an easy thing to get the FAA to recertify. And you see the CEO of Southwest, it was Gary, was Gary Kelly, in that article was relatively scathing. I'm, I'm sure if Southwest I mean, some has of the quotes, more But on the record about Dennis Mullenberg, it was pretty... Yeah, he keeps, I, I, turning, up, he keeps yeah. turning up the pressure. They have had to move their schedule again and again and again because Boeing has been fairly reassuring to all of those CEOs right. they were going to get approval, they thought, by the end of this year. They it, are not on track for that. It does seem like Clearly. the worst thing you can do as a CEO is to overpromise and, and under-deliver, yep. which exactly. has been consistently what Mullenberg has done. Well, exactly. and, and, the, and the Wall Street research analysts have continued to believe him as well. I, mean, I can't. I can't tell you how many guests we've had on this network when I've been here or I'm watching you and they all say, oh, it's going to get back up in the air. And it takes me to the next question, which is Ralph Nader's question. Should this plane be flying at all? And whenever that question gets asked, people jump, oh, you're being hyperbolic. But well, Steve Dixon I, it begs no the question over. whether this ever and, gets and back in the, the air. The new FAA head is no pushover. And he has said, you know, he's a, a pilot himself. He has said this thing's not going to be recertified until he flies it and feels confident you know, um, that it's ready to go. I think one of the big concerns, now I'm starting to hear civilians, people who are not in the markets, say, I don't want to fly on a Boeing jet. See, I, I hear that. And then I always wonder, do you know what what flight, what plane you're booking when you book a flight. I don't. 
I, I, I generally don't, and now you see, you hear of people who say, now I'm looking. I mean, I, I, I don't know if it will actually have an impact, but, but the fact that it has seeped into a consumer mindset away from beyond the investor mindset. It, it will have an impact. I mean, people will have drinks or take uh, drugs before they get on a plane because they have such fear of flying. Uh, prescription drugs. I, I think they will look what? up the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, people with severe fear yeah, of flying will have to fly for their job already, will but... take prescription drugs. Well, I would think that if they were actually were nervous about the 737 MAX, they would look into it and just say, I don't want to be on that plane. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I think, yeah. it will, okay. I think it will happen. To be continued, we'll talk more about this. Uh, but meantime, when we come back, Disney's newest Star Wars movie dominating the weekend box office. But can the studio keep up its win streak? We'll talk more about the company's strategy heading into the new year next. I don't know why I... You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. I've always loved a kitchen experiment, especially smoothies. I've blended all sorts of mad combinations. Strawberry and charcoal, broccoli and chocolate. Not my best, that. But when I test blenders in the Witch Lab, it's not about flavour. It's about performance. Our tests use proper tough stuff, hard ice, strong veg, rough nuts. And the blenders that can hack it are the only ones we recommend for your kitchen. Which tests harder so you can buy smarter? Visit witch.co.uk. Be better informed, be better prepared. The Better Network is on TuneIn. This is Brent Musburger. Search B-E-T-R and start hanging out with me and my guys in the desert weekday afternoons. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? we got you covered. With TuneIn Premium, you can listen to every NFL game live as it's happening. Sean McCoy has an opening on the right side, punches into the end zone for the touchdown. Or catch it later on demand. Offset backs behind Mahomes. The give is to Williams, starts right, cuts it back to the left, and blows into the end zone for the touchdown. You call the plays. Follow the NFL anytime, anywhere, all season long with TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Spend Christmas Day listening to the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Featuring five big matchups on the holiday schedule, unwrap the action starting at 12 Eastern when the Celtics take on the Raptors in Toronto, followed by the Bucks and the 76ers at 2.30. The holiday cheers continue with the Rockets and Warriors at 5 and the Clippers and Lakers at 8 and a showdown between the Pelicans and Nuggets at 10.30. Tis the season with the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. It tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. As we wave goodbye to the 2010s, TuneIn is remembering some of the decade's biggest news stories. In 2011, the Arab Spring sparks anti-government protests across the Middle East and Northern Africa. In 2016, the United Kingdom votes to leave the European Union, forcing the ongoing Brexit crisis. And in 2019, Hong Kong erupts in six months of pro-democracy protests against mainland China. Search news on TuneIn to be there when the next big story breaks. Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, dominating the box office, but it didn't perform as well as some other Star Wars films. So what does that mean for Disney and the state of the box office? Julia Borston joins us now with more. Good morning. Good morning to and Andrew. Well, that's Happy great. holidays. Happy holidays to you, too. you got the red. Everyone's red. It's all very festive. Great to be here. And this holiday season is a very important time at the box office. And no movie bigger this year than Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. It brought in $176 million domestically this weekend. That's the 12th biggest opening of all time. But that is at the lower end of expectations and below the prior two Star Wars, which grows $220 million and nearly $250 million 
respectively. Now, this film's performance was dragged down by some negative reviews, a 57% score on Rotten Tomatoes, and its audience response, a B-plus cinema score, it's actually the lowest rating of the five films that Lucasfilm has released since Disney bought the company. Plus, there's the question of how The Mandalorian and other streaming content is impacting, perhaps raising the bar of going to the movies. But the real test, both for Star Wars and for the state of movie going, is what happens at the box office over the next week. We'll see if Star Wars draws repeat viewings and reaches beyond its core fan base, or if the combination of reviews and less positive word of mouth than prior Star Wars leads to a steep drop-off at the box office over the next few days. Now, the box office is down about 5% year-to-date from last year. Even with that decline, and Skywalker not living up to recent Star Wars openings, Disney still does dominate the movie business. Disney has nearly one-third of box office market share this year. That does not even include movies from Fox. That's up from 26% market share last year. Andrew? Julia, stay with us. Uh, We're going to continue this conversation for more on Disney's dominance or whether they'll stay dominant in the state of the box office is Paul uh, Derek Garb- Der Garbedian. Uh, he is the senior media analyst at Comscore. Good morning to you. Um, Good we've morning. Been talk- I have a, actually just a question. Julia can answer this as well. Has the Rotten Tomatoes number gotten any better or worse over the weekend? Because you'd think that there'd be a lot more people who could well, so technically there are two vote, scores. right? There's the critic score, and then there's the audience score. Okay. The critic score right. was going between sort of 56, 58%, sort of hovering below that 60% mark. The audience score was much better. It was like an 86%, See? but still a B yeah. plus. So audiences like it more than critics. And oftentimes with these movies, you have a big conflict between what audiences and critics think. But it's still, the audience response is not as good is for the prior two Star Wars right. films. Hey, Paul, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah. I have Tom. I have a I, question. I have to, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I have to agree with that. I think when the, the critic score is low, yet the audience score is high, that hopefully we can see this film build over the coming week. And as Julia said, this is a really important corridor. According to our Comscore data, I mean, this week could be half a billion dollars or more, which will add to that revenue. We're running about 4.6% percent behind last year, which was a record-breaking year, but we're going to wind up with around $11.45 billion in North America. That'll be the second biggest box office year ever. Tom had a very smart point. Uh, just, uh, you did. A couple, couple That's one. 45 right. minutes ago. That makes one. No, where he said, look, why is it that Frozen and the Star Wars movie coming out so close together. There seems to be a, a lot of bunching up of all these Disney product at the same time that Disney Plus is just out. Does it make sense in terms of timing? I think it does. I think what Disney does is they keep their brand going. Frozen 2 crossed the billion-dollar mark. It's very likely that Skywalker will hit a billion, which would be their seventh billion-dollar film released in 2019. This past weekend's opening for Skywalker is Disney's seventh $100 million debut in North America in 2019. They have 32% of the market share, and of course, they have their streaming service, Disney Plus, running The Mandalorian. but yeah. Paul, what a, what a, what a, the reason why I ask questions is how do you repeat that trick in 2020? If you look at their lineup for next year, they're not going to have yeah. $7 billion films. And in business, the name of the game is you try to increase your, your, your cash flows each year if possible. Right. That's that's a good point. And by the way, for 2019 to have that many billion dollar movies, I don't know that any studio will repeat that anytime soon. That was kind of an outlier, I think, for any studio to achieve that. Certainly for Disney going into 2020, I mean, they've got Jungle Cruise and Black Widow, the next Marvel movie opening this summer. I don't know how you live up to a year like 2019 for any studio, but I think they have enough there, plus right. the Disney streaming, I'm, that will give them a lot going forward. Okay, one final question. Paul Julia Julia can, can answer this one, maybe. I don't know. Do you think that there are families that want to see this film and say to themselves, you know what? I have Disney+. Plus. I'm just going to look at the clock, and I'm going to wait a couple of months, and hopefully this film will be on Disney+. Plus. Well, I think that that actually may have proven to be more of a thing with Frozen, and it actually, you know, because Frozen has the original one, and you have right. and you have um, all the other, you know, princess content on on Disney Plus. Mandalorian, I think, their question is whether did it drive more interest or did it distract from right. it. I think it's really going to be about the people who are on the bubble, people who are like, well, I like Mandalorian. Right. Um, maybe not families, maybe right. sort of the uh, adult audience. Paul, final word to you. 
They're playing us yeah, out. Yeah, I think Disney's going to have an incredible end of year. We'll have to see how they do in 2020. And, of course, Disney Plus, always a factor. Okay. Paul and Julia, thank you, guys. <laughs> Appreciate it. Happy holidays. When we return, we'll tell you why the SEC is reportedly investigating Slack and some other unicorns for their debuts on the NYSE. Former SEC chairman Harvey Pitt will join us next. Stay here. We'll be right back. At Argos, it's not too late to get them their dream gifts. Shop a wide range of top brands including Lego, Beats and Fitbit. And with Christmas just around the corner, order right up until Christmas Eve to get same-day home delivery. With Argos, you're good to go. Subject to availability, delivery conditions apply. Christmas Eve, order by 1pm, 90% UK coverage. Ho, 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 who's made a list this year? I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through? Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want. And more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes at a panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots, or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express ends 26th of December. Spend Christmas Day listening to the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Featuring five big matchups on the holiday schedule. Unwrap the action starting at 12 Eastern when the Celtics take on the Raptors in Toronto. Followed by the Bucks and the 76ers at 2.30. The holiday cheers continue with the Rockets and Warriors at 5 and the Clippers and Lakers at 8. And a showdown between the Pelicans and Nuggets at 10.30. Tis the season with the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. The Punk Drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. TuneIn brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. TuneIn is remembering the biggest college sports moments of the decade, like this one from 2016, when Oklahoma's Baker Mayfield hurls a 49-yard touchdown pass to D.D. Westbrook in a legendary shootout with Patrick Mahomes and the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Snap, play action, rolling right, Baker, one to go deep, he's going to sling it for the end zone, looking for D.D., he's got it! He's got a touchdown! Search college sports on TuneIn to be there for the moments that go down in history. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. Hello from the other side. The 2010s saw yet another revolution in the way we listen to music. With music fans giving up CDs and digital downloads for streaming services and internet radio like TuneIn. At the same time, vinyl sales continue to rise to levels not seen since the format's original decline. Keep listening to TuneIn for more trends of the 2010s. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. As we wave goodbye to the 2010s, TuneIn is remembering some of the decade's biggest news stories. In 2011, the Arab Spring sparks anti-government protests across the Middle East and Northern Africa. In 2016, the United Kingdom votes to leave the European Union, forcing the ongoing Brexit crisis. And in 2019, Hong Kong erupts in six months of pro-democracy protest against mainland China. Search news on TuneIn to be there when the next big story breaks. Welcome back, everybody. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that the SEC is investigating Slack and other unicorns on the New York Stock Exchange. This probe will focus on how trading was handled on day one and other issues as well. For more on this, let's welcome former SEC Chairman Harvey Pitt. He is now the CEO of Calorama Partners. And uh, Chairman Pitt, thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure. Uh, how should we read into this? What, what do you think is happening? Well, I think um, this is a very uh, logical extension of the Commission's uh, staff's concerns with how 
uh, IPOs and other uh, preliminary offerings are being handled. In particular, I think they're worried about how price determinations take place, the independence of those who uh, uh, tend to be uh, the uh, market, designated market makers and the like, and making sure that all risk disclosures are fully disclosed. Have you been concerned with what you've seen in the IPO market this year? I think there are some questions about how the process is operating. In the area of direct exchange listings, which is what Slack and before it Spotify reflect, there have been um, questions about how the pricing was determined. And uh, it, those questions, I think, are difficult to answer without conducting a thorough investigation, which appears to be what the SEC is doing. Tom, you ran the NYSE. What do you think? To, <laughs> to say I'm close to this situation is, is a bit of an understatement because I, I worked with my colleagues to help design the direct listing, and I was involved in many of these IPOs. So I have to be a little bit circumspect. Um, first of all, the, the report in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend really said nothing. Uh, I don't know if you read it. It had this very prominent placement, but it said, oh, the SEC is in investigating. Um, what I suspect, and I have no firsthand knowledge, what I suspect they're investigating is what happens before a listing transpires. I, I doubt that they're investigating is the, is the correct price, the price at open, because when you look at the Spotify and Slack direct listings or many of these IPOs, they trade very, very smoothly on the New York sure. Stock Exchange. More smoothly, in fact, than pretty much any, any exchange in the world. But what happens before is a little bit of a black box to the investing public. It's, you know, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley do an incredible job on these big IPOs of balancing orders, buys and sells. But the process of how, does, how do those orders make it into the book? How is that communicated? to the public, and I think it's healthy to look at that and to say, are we doing the best job possible? Are we providing the most transparency? And with the advent of direct listings, now's, now's the time. Sure. So I viewed it as largely a, a good thing uh, that the SEC is looking at it, but I want to just reiterate, it's not clear what exactly they are looking at. Well, Harvey, part of the question has to be the valuations that we saw in the private markets before. Um, clearly, some of those valuations were, were just a nosebleed territory and didn't deserve to be there. Yeah, I, I want to make it clear. The SEC uh, wouldn't be looking into what the correct valuation was or anything of that nature. That is not the SEC's task, and they uh, scrupulously avoid that. What they'd be looking at are the processes that take place to set the price, and then also the surrounding disclosures and particularly risk factors. Sure. So uh, while I agree that we don't know what the SEC is investigating, uh, what we do know is that this is a process that is relatively new. Its use by large companies is very new. And the entire uh, review here will serve very well the markets and those who invest in these securities. Mm -hmm. Harvey, thank you for joining us today. It's an My interesting pleasure. conversation, and I'm sure we'll have you back to talk more about it. Also want to thank Joanne Lippman. It's been great seeing you. Thank, thank you. you. Us great for the to be hour. here. Happy Thanks. holidays. Happy holidays, and we will see you back here soon. Absolutely. Happy holidays to you all. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne. When we return, uh, are investors going to get more record highs for Christmas? That's the question. Take a look at futures right now. It looks that way. Dow looks like it's going to open up about 55 points higher. Squawk returns with two big hours ahead. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes at a panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots, or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express ends 26th of December. Right now, instead of hearing this, you could be listening to the music that keeps you moving with TuneIn Premium. Find today's biggest songs and all of your favorites commercial free. Visit TuneIn.com com slash premium to upgrade when you're not listening to your team take it to the end zone the rim 
or the net. Keep up with the biggest moments in sports by following TuneIn on social media. Block, hook, into the end zone for the touchdown. From reminders of the live top games to tips of the best sports stations and podcasts. Welcome to Undisputed. We are live from Los Angeles. I'm Jenny Taft here with Skip Bayless. Follow and tune in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get the most out of TuneIn. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Hi, I'm Tom Haberstroh, host of the Haberstroh Podcast. I'm partnering with TuneIn to answer a few questions and get you prepped for NBA Christmas Day. I wanted to start an NBA podcast because I wanted to take you behind the scenes and hear it from the people that make the NBA tick. It's the most intimate platform for the most intimate sport. And podcasts are the perfect medium to capture that intimacy. Search The Haber Show to listen to new episodes every Friday throughout the NBA season on TuneIn. Santa Claus is coming to Wall Street, and he's bringing a rally right along with his sack of gifts. Tariffs and trade. The U.S. and China are trying to get a deal done. The latest comments from both sides straight ahead. Plus, President Trump's tax cuts two years later. One of the architects of the plan, Art Laffer, will join us live. The second hour of Squawk Box begins right now. Good morning and welcome back to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin along with Becky Quick in studio this morning. Tom Farley is hanging out, CEO of Farpoint Ventures and a CNBC contributor and a reviewer of movies, including Cats and Frozen 2. Uh, If you missed it last hour, we might surprise his review a little bit later. Also joining us this hour, CNBC contributor Peter Bookvar of Bleakley Advisory Group. Uh, Take a look at U.S. equity futures this morning. Uh, We're wearing red, but the nice idea is we got some green on the screen. Uh, Dow Jones looking like it would open up about 57 points higher. NASDAQ looking to open higher as well. A little over 21 points, about 21 points right now. And the S&P 500 looking to open about five and a half points higher on this holiday week. All right, let's get you caught up on some of the headlines at this hour. China has announced a cut in import prices, or in import tariffs, I should say, for frozen pork, drugs, and some high-tech products. The cut applies to all of China's trading partners, but of course comes in the wake of the U.S. and China announcing their phase one trade deal last week. Gasoline prices have fallen four cents over the last two weeks. The latest Lundberg survey puts the average price at $2.61 a gallon. However, that's still 18 cents higher than it was a year ago. And more investors are taking note of the stock market's record run. About $16.6 billion flowed into U.S. equity funds last week, according to Bank of America, a report that they've put out. That is the highest weekly inflow in three months, part of the reason you keep seeing new highs every day, including on Friday. And some news just in from sports betting company DraftKings. It's going to become a public company through a business combination with two other entities. One of them is Diamond Eagle Acquisition Corp. That's a special purpose acquisition company, a SPAC, that is traded on the NASDAQ. The other is SB Tech. That's a provider of sports betting technology. Once the transaction is complete, the combined company will be known as DraftKings, and it will trade on NASDAQ under a new ticker symbol. We'll talk to the CEO of DraftKings. That's coming up at uh, 740 Eastern time about why he's doing this, what the purpose is. Uh, Jason Robbins will be right Right. here on set with us. We'll get into this with Jason. Can we get a preview? The SPAC king is over here. He's in the middle of a SPAC. Tom Farley is trying to do a SPAC. You're doing a SPAC. SPAC is no longer a four-letter word. It's the wave of the future. Blank check company. I'm I'm listening to Becky tell this story with a big smile on my face. So what do you you make of it? I'm looking forward to talking about it. I I think this is a great company to to merge with a SPAC. I think they have a great market, right? We can talk about uh, uh, online betting, right. we can talk about New Jersey. Uh, I suspect they they viewed this as a better better path to be in public than an IPO, and that's kind of the gospel I've been preaching for why, a year now. Why, why do you think it's better to go by SPAC? Is it, is it easier? Is it faster? Is it, are there less hurdles you jump through? It, it of- depends. It's not, it's not great for every potential uh, prospect. I suspect, and we'll ask the CEO, I suspect in their case it was a little bit easier because when you're combining two different companies, there's a story to tell there to IPO investors. You're limited in a quiet period, a cooling off period. Uh, in an IPO, you're not so limited with a SPAC. You can spend all the time you want sitting down with Fidelity two days if you need to to 
to tell the story, and you can do it a little bit. You can do it a little bit quicker. You don't have to go through all of the traditional uh, IPO prep in order to do a SPAC, and uh, you can have a, a, a certain price and a certain proceeds. Whereas with a traditional IPO, you don't know either. Right. Okay. We'll talk a lot more about that in just about 15 minutes with the CEO of DraftKings in the middle of all of this. Meantime, big story of the markets for the year have been tariffs and trade. Kayla Tausch joins us this morning from Washington with a look at how this story is likely to develop in the new year. Kayla. Well, Andrew, it was certainly a volatile year for trade. 2020 could calm down a little bit, although the wild card could be the election. The Trump administration rocked the trade boat in 2019 with unpredictable tariffs and short-lived truces. In 2020, international trade will move back toward the status quo. First, China tensions return to a simmer. Fireworks will fade when the U.S. and China sign off on a phase one deal in early January. A second deal will remain far off, but if China engages on and enforces this first deal, expect tariffs to be rolled back slowly. Second, farm finances will be in focus. As planting season gets underway, American farmers will size up the pain of a two-year trade war and the salve of new business with China, Mexico, Canada, and Japan. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue says more financial aid will be warranted if the ag economy doesn't rebound quickly. Third, Europe will be back in the crosshairs. As President Trump eyes re-election, he'll home in on a new target, the EU. With rising tariffs on luxury goods, the president's stump speeches will be testing ground for new material on auto tariffs and energy sanctions. But he'll pocket those fights until after November. So that is what is expected, but Andrew, Becky, Tom, we all know that the status quo can change with a single tweet. Okay. Hey, Caleb, before you go, you mentioned Europe and these auto tariffs, but you think that's a post, that's a post November 2020 situation, or you're suggesting, uh, that's what I was trying to understand there. Well, legal experts are divided on whether the administration still has the authority to actually put those in place because they missed the deadline in November to issue a report or make a decision. Right. Some within the administration think that they can still do that. Others think that they would need to open a brand new investigation to do that. But pretty much all of the president's advisors are advising him not to go forward with auto tariffs at the very least until after the election. Okay. Uh, Kayla, thank you for that report. Uh, meantime, in the last days of the year, the stock market tends to perform uh, unusually well during what uh, Wall Street calls the Santa Claus rally. The S&P now has gained an average of 1.3% since 1950. Joining us right now to talk strategy ahead of the last days of 2019, Keith Banks, Vice Chairman and Head of Investment Solutions at Bank of America. Uh, Stephen Reese, a Global Investment Strategist at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. And Jim Paulson, Chief Investment Strategist at uh, Luthold Group. Good morning to everybody Here's the actually. Let me ask a statistical question because I don't know the answer. Yes, there's the nice little run up in the Santa Claus rally, but tell me what happens in the first ten days of January. Does right. it get given back or no? I, I think markets continue to go higher in the first quarter. I mean, we're talking about the flows just coming back in the last couple of months. Um, we're looking forward to the fourth quarter earnings season. Right. This year, earnings were terrible. Right, one and a half percent growth in the S and P 500. I think we're going to see an acceleration into next year, helped by a lot of things, and most notably trade. So. I think it continues to go to go higher. We could see some consolidation, but those, in my opinion, are, are, are opportunities to add. Right. You're optimistic, too. We, we are optimistic. I, I, I'm not good at 10-day increments, but right. as we go into, uh, into 2020, we're still in the midst of a very aggressive, global, uh, synchronized easing cycle. Uh, rates are going to continue to come down. Balance sheets of central banks around the world will continue to increase. And, and finally, we're seeing countries utilize fiscal policy to also drive economic, economic activity, powerful stuff. Can I take us back to where we were a year ago? Because Tom brought this up before. He's right. I mean, markets up 37 percent, and this is for the S&P, <clears throat> from where we were at the low of December 24th last year. How were you guys feeling on Christmas Eve last year? Did you think we would be at this point now? It was a tough Christmas Eve. Yeah. We worked a lot. <laughs> um, I think, you know, just keep in mind where we are today with the 30 percent plus rally, 18 times for multiple. It's a little expensive, but not, I think, in bubble territory. So for us, this year is going to be all about finding the earnings growth. We think earnings can grow close to 9% for the S&P So 500. no more multiple expansion. This has I mean, to be about earnings growth. Could possibly happen, but we're not calling for that. So. You, you, think yeah. it, you think it'll come in at 9%? Because right now, the forward estimates are about 9%. And, we, and, and we've heard from a lot of analysts who yeah. say, yeah, but that's going to come down. We're really yeah. going to see 5 to 6%. Consensus starts the year higher. I think the buy set expectations are a bit lower. I, I think the risks are to the upside this year right. with respect to earnings. Hey, Jim. 
You there? Yeah. Yeah, multiple so right. expansion. How much? How how much of a possibility is the multiple expansion story in twenty twenty? Well, I, I think it's uh, less likely than it's been this year, Andrew, because I think uh, yields and interest rates are going to be moving up in two thousand twenty. But we've had periods, uh, even back if you go to the last big rally in uh, seventeen uh, into eighteen, where yields went up and P's continued to expand as well. So it could happen. But I, I don't I don't disagree. I think the catalyst for 2020 gains is probably earnings. Um, you know, one thing I'd point out is I looked, we didn't have a bear market in 2018, but we got within a razor edge of 20% decline on December 24th. And so I, I look back since 1950 at every first year bull market, uh, and the average of all those is just about what we did here in 2019. In many regards, it felt like the first year of a bull market. Uh, a wall of doubt emerges. We had weak earnings, but we were uh, kept in, uh, going up with massive drops in yields and, and massive policy stimulus. And we had doubt all year long. I think 2020, a year two of the bull, it goes up another 10%. Typically, that'd be like 35, 3,600 on the S&P if it continues to track that. But the difference is in year two, optimism returns. Fundamentals actually start to improve. Earnings actually start to go up. And even though yields climb, the stock market continues to rise because more and more players that are underinvested come back to the market. Becky met, uh, mentioned the flow into equities here. That could be a common theme in 2020. I have a question uh, on the earnings story. One of the characteristics of 2019 was a decline in earnings because profit margins receded yeah. because labor costs were rising. Yeah. What's the math to get to 9% earnings growth? Does that mean profit margins start to reverse higher and labor costs stop going up? I think it's 4 to 5% revenue growth, a bit of a benefit from stock buybacks, but less than we've seen in the recent past. And then our, our big calls up margins will actually expand this year. Driven and, by uh, trade. Can I ask one more question? One of the big issues that's been missing is capital expenditures. CEOs right. yeah. have not felt good about things. If you see the markets pick up, if confidence comes back, could that be the next thing that really fuels a rally? The CEOs deciding, okay, we're, we're going to spend again. Yeah, that's still a wild card in our mind. Becky, it's a great point, though. We're seeing all this without CapEx really, really taking off. And another interesting thing to your point earlier, if we were sitting here a year ago, we were expecting four rate hikes this year, mm -hmm. right. and we got three rate cuts. Right. And so you talk about a dramatic turnaround. Um, Just but, things you can predict and things you can't. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and the point around flows is really interesting. We're seeing some flows at the end of the year, and like you said, Andrew, you, you kind of get that. Right. But there's flows in equities are still negative this year overall. And if you go back to 2000 On a really bullish year. So a really mean? bullish year. So back to the PE point, one of the ways you can get some PE expansion, although we are big believers it'll be it'll be earnings that drive the rally next year, is if you start seeing real flows, positive flows in equities for the first time since 2008. Okay. Uh, Keith, Stephen, and Jim, thank you guys. Thank you. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Thanks. Thanks. When we come back, you can call it a silver lining. Boeing Starliner lands safely after part of its mission failed. We'll talk about what's next in the great space race when we return. First, though, make sure to subscribe to our podcast. It's called Squawk Pod. You get the interviews we do, behind-the-scenes access, and much more. You can get it wherever you get your podcast. Stay tuned. Squawk Box will be right back. I used to say, I want to gain muscle, but... You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Ah, Christmas, a time for sharing gifts and laughter and photos and videos. Make the most of it with a SIM-only deal packed with data from Tesco Mobile. Like a 10-gig SIM for just £13 a month. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile today. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 29th of December. 12-month contract and unlocked 4G-enabled phone required. Terms apply. See TescoMobile.com terms. 
always loved a kitchen experiment, especially smoothies. I've blended all sorts of mad combinations. Strawberry and charcoal, broccoli and chocolate. Not my best, that. But when I test blenders in the Witch Lab, it's not about flavour, it's about performance. Our tests use proper tough stuff, hard ice, strong veg, rough nuts. And the blenders that can hack it are the only ones we recommend for your kitchen. Witch tests harder so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. Ho, ho, ho. Who's made a list this year? I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through? Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus. Offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th, 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. So it's already December 23rd. Well, at Boots, this Christmas, there's better than half price on selected gifts. Save money on gifts like Babylus Elegance Straightener was £79.99, now only £35, and other selected products. Get on it today at the What to Buy Your Nearest without it being the dearest boutique at your nearest Boots in London White City Shopping Centre. So gift like you get them before it ends 24th of December at selected stores and boots.com. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app and see the latest additions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. We've got an update on a story that we first saw launch right here on Friday morning. Boeing Starliner is back on Earth after a successful landing. The spacecraft landed in White Sands, New Mexico, just before 8 o'clock Eastern time yesterday. NASA says this marks the first time that an American-made, human-rated capsule has touched down on land. That is pretty amazing. It came with these three parachutes that helped it descend slowly, and then it was able to send something out that acted as a cushion for while it landed. Now, of course, this return comes after a rocky start for the Starliner. An autonomous flight control system fired at the wrong time shortly after the launch, and that put it in the wrong orbit. Because it was in the wrong orbit, that prevented the capsule from connecting with the International Space Station as it was supposed to do as part of its mission. But again, I think the more important part is that it landed safely. That would have been yep. a much scarier situation if you couldn't bring astronauts back safely. Boeing said that it was still able to conduct tests of many parts of the spacecraft while it was in orbit. The next Starliner mission was scheduled to carry astronauts, but NASA said it's too early to say if that will happen next. And SoftBank's talks to secure $3 billion from Japan's three biggest banks reportedly have stalled as lenders hit uh, internal lending limits. Reuters reporting that SoftBank is likely to enter the new year without the financing in place for WeWork's $9.5 billion rescue package. The report says the deadlock in Japan led SoftBank to secure a $1.75 billion line of credit. You'll remember from Goldman Sachs, we reported that and told you about it last week. But um, so wait a second, this, do we know it? if they have a financing out in that in that WeWork deal? <laughs> so in other words, do we, is, did they commit hard to finance WeWork or did they? I think they're locked because I think the idea was they thought that these banks in Japan were going to loan them money against SoftBank, not against the WeWork, and uh, not against the WeWork, not against WeWork. And the issue was they didn't think that the banks were going to say, we object to this transaction. Because typically, when, uh, when a bank lends a big corporation money, it's not about where the money is going. Right? The relationships. Right? It's right. a relationship. And I think they thought, so now, by the way, the relationship, from what I understand, is actually strained with Mitsubishi. I mean, you go, you go to the different banks, it's a problem. Well, oftentimes in these types no, of transactions, are. there is a financing yes. out where it says, I commit to do this, but oh, by the way, if the banks say no, I can rip up but the I contract. believe that the loan was never against WeWork. Okay. It was always a soft bank. Soft bank parent. Soft bank parent I see. loan, and that's why. Well, that's a much... It's a much more, more conservative loan. And a much more, but also now more complicated. Because the idea was they thought they were going to get SoftBank rates, not WeWork rates. Uh, meaning right. in terms of what the loan was going right. to be. And that's right. why they could do it and why the economics why they sense. thought made sense. Yeah, and the, and the difference is pretty radical. Yes. Right. Okay, coming up, but when we return, promising new findings in a quest to screen for heart problems long before any signs of trouble. Got some good news to bring you. We got the details on that story next. Plus, the futures right now, uh, some nice green ahead of the holidays. 75 points up on the Dow, S&P 500 looking open. About 65 points, uh, six point five, six, six and a half points higher. Stay tuned, you're watching Squawk and see you Ah, 
Christmas, a time for celebrating, unwrapping and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone 6S with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. You or your business accounts? Who's the boss here? Say goodbye to that shoebox full of receipts and hello to simple solutions from Sage. Over a million British businesses already rely on Sage and we can support you to free up your future with smarter bookkeeping that automates repetitive tasks and gives you the insight you need to inform your decisions. Win-win. Find out more at sage.com forward slash automate. So it's already December 23rd. Well, at Boots, this Christmas, there's better than half price on selected gifts. Save money on gifts like number seven, best face forward was £80, now only £39, and other selected products. Get on it today at the What to Buy Your Bestie for the Leasty Boutique at your nearest Boots in London White City Shopping Centre. So gift like you get them before it ends 24th of December at selected stores and boots.com. NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. Tonight, TuneIn has your Monday night NFL football with the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Kickoff at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Goes up, dart toward the end. Oh, caught, ball, caught, ball, touchdown for the touchdown of the left corner. Bucks take the lead. Fire at the home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. That's why I need a one dance. The 2010s was the decade of the surprise album drop. I see it, I want it. Where artists from Beyonce, Drake, and Frank Ocean to Radiohead, U2, and the late David Bowie skipped the traditional promotion cycle to bring their music directly to fans with little to no warning. Keep listening to TuneIn for more trends of the 2010s. Welcome back, everybody. The FDA has granted breakthrough status for an algorithm that can screen for heart failure during routine physicals. Joining us right now is ECHO co-founder and CEO Connor Landgraf, also Dr. Paul Friedman, the Mayo Clinic's cardiovascular department chair. They are co-developers of the algorithm, and for viewers, uh, frequent squawk viewers, you have seen some of this before, thanks to Dr. Friedman already explaining some of this to us. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. And Dr. Friedman, for viewers who weren't with us last time, describe what this algorithm does. Sure. So heart failure is a condition where the heart pump is weak. That can lead to shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, arrhythmias, and in some cases, sudden death. And it turns out that about 7 million Americans don't know that they have the condition. 9% of people over the age of 60. So this algorithm was trained using artificial intelligence on roughly 100,000 ECGs where we would show the computer an ECG and say, is a weak heart pump present, yes or no? And over a period of time, it learned to identify subtle patterns that even an expert human can't see. So what the algorithm does in its final form is in 15 seconds, it can read your ECG and tell you whether or not a weak heart pump is present, something that usually requires a test like an echocardiogram or an MRI scan that costs thousands of dollars and may take you away from work for an hour or two or three to be seen by a specialist. Connor, explain to us what Echo's role in all of this is and, and, and what comes next. We've been partnered with the uh, Mayo Clinic to develop the technology and be able to test it on handheld ECG devices so that it can be a very equi uh, quick, efficient and quick screen um, in, the, in the physician's office. Uh, and what this breakthrough status means for us is that we're able to collaborate with the FDA. We get a priority review with them, uh, and hopefully we can get this technology in the hands of clinicians and patients much more quickly. How, how quickly do you think that can happen, and what will this technology look like? It's very hard to say. Uh, with these applications, it can take upwards of a few years. Our hope would be that we could get it on the market within a year, but uh, it's, it's pretty challenging to say exactly what that approval process will look like. Is it going to look like a watch? Is it going to look like um, a piece of equipment that I buy and put on my finger? How, uh, as a consumer, how would I handle this? We've built a digital stethoscope and ECG combination device. Mm -hmm. 
that clinicians can use. They can wear around their neck and they can screen every patient just as they would with a normal stethoscope. And that really puts this AI technology in everyday clinicians' hands and enables them to use it as a, you know, um, easy to use piece of medical equipment rather than a complex, you know, medical device. How is this different than what Apple has put into its watch, what Fitbit is using, what all of these different companies that are trying to get directly to the consumer and have it be a piece of equipment that they're wearing all the time? How, how, how is this different? This algorithm is a, is a more innovative algorithm in that we're screening for a condition that we didn't know necessarily was possible to detect with ECG previously. And that's what the work at the Mayo Clinic has shown is that we're able to find this correlation between the ECG and the patient's uh, heart pump efficiency that was impossible to detect by just human visual estimation or looking at an ECG. Dr. Freeman, I think that was the thing that we were most astounded by when you came into studio and showed us how it worked. Um, through AI, artificial intelligence, they're now able to recognize and look at something and basically tell if somebody's heart looks like it's the heart of a 68-year-old or the heart of a 43-year-old, and that doesn't always match up with how old the patient actually is, but it does tell you about their physical health. Oh, that's right. These signals that our bodies are giving off have important physiologic information. And now with the use of artificial intelligence, we can read it. We've done a number of studies showing that it works in retrospective data, and we're now in the process of doing the prospective studies, doing that last mile of artificial intelligence showing that in the real world, when we use it prospectively, we're helping people. And our partnership with ECHO is to make it part of our standard routine. So for the nurses and doctors and pharmacists and the uh, hundreds of thousands of people who wear stethoscopes, they're doing what they always do, but now they're getting additional information. And it's important information, which is why it got breakthrough designation from FDA, because if we find heart failure is present, there are many well-established, well-proven treatments. And those treatments prevent the development of symptoms, prevent early death, and so identifying the presence of this condition is important. And hopefully now by making these tools readily available in the workflow, you can have a routine checkup that can identify things that may have been missed before. We should point out this is just a one step in a long history that Mayo Clinic has of, of revolutionizing and coming up with new ways of doing things. Everything from forcing people, forcing doctors to sterilize, um, all the way through proton beam therapy. Um, so this is another exciting step, and we want to thank you both for being with us today. Connor, Dr. Freeman, uh, we'll talk to you again soon for another update. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Okay, still to come right here on Squawk Box. So much more. Boeing CEO goes to Washington. We're just learning right now more about his strategy for talking to regulators and getting the MAX flying again. We'll talk about that and more when Squawk returns right after this. Claire. You know it's out there somewhere but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants, and sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Hello, I'm Joe Brand. When I see people homeless over Christmas, I find it really upsetting. Whether they're sleeping in doorways, on buses or in hostels, it just shouldn't be happening. But it doesn't have to be like this. This Christmas, crisis centres across Britain are providing warmth and safety, plus long-term support to find people a job and a home. Please reserve a place for someone at Crisis this Christmas for just £28.87p. Go to crisis.org.uk now. Thank you. Spend Christmas Day listening to the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Featuring five big matchups on the holiday schedule, unwrap the action starting at 12 Eastern when the Celtics take on the Raptors in Toronto, followed by the Bucks and the 76ers at 2.30. The holiday cheers continue with the Rockets and Warriors at 5 and the Clippers and Lakers at 8 and a showdown between the Pelicans and Nuggets at 10.30. Tis the season with the NBA on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Looks, passes on, goes in the end zone, touchdown! 
Ready for NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. Tonight, TuneIn has your Monday night NFL football with the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Kick off at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Those up, dart toward the end. Oh, caught, ball, caught, ball, touchdown for the touchdown of the left quarter. Bucks take the lead. Fire at home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Tune in is remembering the biggest college sports moments of the decade, like this one from 2011, when UConn point guard Kemba Walker hits the game-winning jumper in the Big East tournament against Pittsburgh. Here's Walker with four, stops, moves left, steps back, the jumper, it's good! And the buzzer, and Kemba Walker has done it again! Search college sports on TuneIn to be there for the moments that go down in history. Ho, ho, ho. Want to make Santa's job a whole lot easier this year? Tune in Premium is the gift your loved ones can enjoy all year long. Featuring commercial-free news from MSNBC, Fox News Talk, and CNBC. Global concerns about climate change not stopping. The most generous state in the U.S. on GoFundMe is... Plus, commercial-free music and live sports. TuneIn Premium brings the best in audio to you. Forget the stocking and stuff their phone with TuneIn Premium. Happy holidays. Search Premium to start your free trial. Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. A new report over the weekend shedding light on the first face-to-face encounter between Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg and FAA Chief Stephen Dixon taking place last week in Washington. Joining us right now to discuss this is Seth Kaplan, principal at Kaplan Research. Uh, good morning to you, Seth. Happy holidays. Uh, what a story it was. It really made you think, or at least made me think, that this plane may not be getting in the air uh, anytime soon and that the, the friction is real. It is, and gosh, all of those projections over the months of, uh, the, you know, first obviously many months ago, then the end of the year, long after it was clear to everybody else that there, there was no way the plane could be recertified by the end of the year. But yeah, they in some ways seem as, as far away as ever, don't they? And, uh, you know, the, 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 with, with the FAA telling, uh, with, with Stephen Dixon telling Mullenberg, no more, uh, no more, artificial timelines and we've learned now from that report his predecessor Elwell was saying the same thing even as Boeing was continuing to put out their artificial timelines well so the other question you saw Gary Kelly from Southwest you know on the record in that story really going after the company Yeah, and that's a long-term issue for Boeing, even if Southwest never orders anything other than a Boeing. Because when Southwest procured airplanes for, you know, basically its entire 50-year or so history until now, they never had any credibility if they suggested to Boeing that they were willing to look elsewhere, right? So on one hand, they got good volume discounts for being a great customer. But on the other hand, they, they really had no leverage. Whereas I think we all believe that Southwest really is willing to order something else. Its bias is to still order Boeing because of all the scale it has. But uh, that's going to put downward pressure on pricing forever. Right. So, Seth, here's the question I have, which is, look, I admire the stance that Dennis Mullenberg has taken, which is to say that he wants to see this out, meaning he wants to be in the seat, he thinks he's the right person to be in the seat until this plane gets in the air, and I get that. The question I have is a credibility one and the idea of effectively changing pilots uh, in the midair, if you will, at this point, which is to say if you're the board of Boeing, you clearly, this credibility issue is real. It's not a a not real issue because it's a real issue with with regulators. It's also a real issue uh, with uh, buyers and clients. And yet, if you change out pilots midair, does that make the situation better or worse? So at what point, basically, would you rather see what, what's behind door number three? Would you this rather This is the deal fundamental with the question, if yeah. you're the board I, of the company. I think the starting point is that the board of a company's job is to increase the value of the company. And let me ask you this. What do you think happens if, if, if there's an announcement that Mullenberg is leaving? I mean, I think the shares at this point rise. Uh, obviously, then the question is, who's next? And, and, and uh, you know, would you want that job? But I, I, I think at some point, you know, is he more a part of the problem than the solution? We know this is not all his fault. 
Uh, but the, the you know not only the the design issues, but the response has sort of been repeatedly botched from the early days. And I know it's been tough. And the Wall Street Journal story sort of confirmed what you could see, which is that he had uh, lawyers pulling at him to say one thing. And uh, but Seth, you, I'm going to make it harder yeah, for you. You yeah. can't put Calhoun in the job because people will say it's, it's the same problem, right? Because he's been there the whole time. Right. If you take whoever you think the number two, three, or four person is, I'm not sure that works either because you're going to, again, this is a credibility thing. So you're going to bring somebody in effectively from the outside who's supposed to credentialize this whole process, and yet the outsider doesn't know all the ins and outs of what's been going on for the past year. Right. Uh, no, it, it, exactly. And, and I think you call somebody like Richard Anderson, who's now running Amtrak, turning it around, and who previously turned around Delta, and who has all kinds of credibility in terms of a you know, now a safety turnaround at Amtrak, and who knows Stephen Dixon well. The problem is Boeing, you can only, uh, there's a mandatory retirement age of 65, and he's 64 and a half. Uh, but, you know, at least in some kind of a caretaker role, I think it's got to be somebody like that. You're right. That's the problem is whoever has the institutional knowledge is somebody who's going to, uh, to some degree, be perceived as part of the problem. I think it's somebody who can come up to speed quickly but has that credibility with the FAA because right. this, again, this is a long-term problem. The next aircraft certification process is going to be very different and is going to cost many billions of dollars more probably right. because everything that's going on right now. Seth, always great to uh, get your perspective on all of this. Appreciate Likewise. it. Happy, happy holidays we yeah, don't see too. before Christmas. You bet. Absolutely. All right, when we return, the big business of sports betting. We will talk to the CEO of DraftKings about his big deal that was just announced. This all comes just ahead of the college bowl season in the NFL playoffs. Talk about how they're going to be going public. Squawk Box will be right back. My dental problem started as a child. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. Ah, Christmas. A time for celebrating, unwrapping and unwinding. Capture every moment with an epic iPhone success with a 12 megapixel camera. Now only $12.99 a month from Tesco Mobile, saving you £72. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Saving £2 per month over 36 months was £14.99. 36 month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements required. Subject to status, terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. Don't believe me, just watch. The 2010s saw the rise of the viral hit when meme-ready tracks like Gangnam Style, Open Gangnam Style, The Harlem Shake, The Harlem Shake. <laughs> what does the fox say? What does the fox say? And of course, Old Town Road snowballed from internet oddities to global phenomenons. I got the horses in the bag. Keep listening to tune in for more trends of the 2010s. Welcome back, everybody. Sports betting company DraftKings will become a public company in 2020 through a three way business combination. It's going to be combining with a special purpose acquisition company called Diamond Eagle. Diamond Eagle is already traded on the NASDAQ. It's also combining with SB Tech, that's a provider of sports betting technology. Now, when all is said and done, the newly combined company is going to be renamed DraftKings, which is the name you all know. Joining us right now, first on CNBC, is DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins. And Jason, it's great to see you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Everybody. Happy holidays. Um, some big news, and you've kind of wrapped all this together. 
I think I get it. SPAC, uh, using the SPAC to go public makes a lot of sense, but why don't you explain what the rationale is, why this makes sense for DraftKings right now? Well, this is a complicated deal. It's a three-way merger. Um, we looked at different options for financing it, and this one made a lot of sense because it allowed us to both secure capital up front through a pipe that would then be, uh, be used to complete the acquisition of SB Tech. Yes. Well, they we raised an additional pipe as well, which so three hundred plus yeah, million dollars led by Cap Research, well. Franklin Templeton, Wellington, several other great ones, and uh, then we also you know wanted to get public sometime in twenty twenty, ideally, and. Uh, this allowed us to do both of them in the same uh, transaction as opposed to two separate transactions, so it was a good fit for us. And then SB Tech getting wrapped in, they do the back-end technology that you'll be using instead of the company that you use right now? Yeah, SB Tech is a world-renowned technology and trading and risk management provider for sports betting and other sorts of online gaming services. They've been around for about 12 years, I think, and really a fantastic company. We're looking forward to it. Had you not done it this way, would have it been a two-step process, yeah. meaning go public and then either merge with them or buy them? Or the other way around, raise private you. capital to buy them and then go public together. So it would, have, it would have probably been one of those two options. We considered those two along with this, and this allowed us to do both at the same time. I think this is a great example of, of using a SPAC. In a, He's in the SPAC way. business, by the way, we should say. Yeah, but no, this is right. it's what we talked about a half hour ago. I mean, there's a, there's a real reason for you to do it this way, and congratulations. Thank I, you. I, I'm, I'm furiously kind of going through the investor presentation here and commercial breaks. I have a couple questions. One, uh, do I have it right that revenue next year will be around about 500 million and change and the enterprise value here is something like 3 billion that's right so we'll be about 540 uh, in revenue as a combined business next year and we expect uh, about 3.3 billion uh, to be the market capitalization upon close okay and how how did investors get uh, comfortable with that valuation level what comps do you point them to uh, that was uh, that's above my pay grade. We had a lot of bankers that worked on the deal. It did a great job helping. It's a unique company, so it was difficult to comp, I think, and uh, a lot of work went into it for sure. And one thing I've never seen in a SPAC, and I've looked at a lot of them, is the dual class share structure. This is the first time I've I've ever come across that. How did that come to be? Well, we felt that this was an industry that was going to take lots of twists and turns, and it was really important that the management be able to think long term and. One of the things that we you know, thought about as becoming a public company is you don't want to fall into the traps of getting too caught up in quarterly earnings and things like that. And obviously, that's an important thing, and we need to you know, hit the numbers that we promised, but we also want to have the flexibility to be able to think long-term and really plan on what will drive value over the next three to five so years the, and beyond. The original SPAC was a single class. Right. Correct. So, you've had to, so as part of this transaction, you're effectively changing the classes of shares. Well, the whole thing is changing because it's right. you know three-way merger, so everything kind of hit reset. And um, and and as you, talk, I mean, one of the things that is interesting about a SPAC is you can actually speak to investors, as you said, for as long as you need to. And you can share projections, right. which is distinct from an IPO. And in fact, they have shared projections. And so the question I was going to ask is, how comfortable or not, and how many questions did you get about the governance issue when it comes to talking to some of the big investors on this? Well, you're absolutely right that one of the benefits is to be able to socialize not only, you know, the deal and the valuation, but other aspects of it. So uh, we were pretty thorough. We talked to a lot of investors and um, generally speaking, you know, we got a lot of really good feedback on everything. And uh, I think that for the most part, we kind of stuck where we were, but we did make some changes along the way, which is, you know, a helpful part of the SPAC process to be able to get that feedback. Jason, can I just ask, in terms of raising money going public um, with the new fund that you've set up, why do you need to raise money right now? You guys are growing really fast in terms of revenue. What's the plan? What are you going to do with it? Well, there's a lot of new states that have recently legalized online sports betting. Michigan just recently, Colorado uh, about a month or so before. Um, so we have a lot of really exciting, you know, new markets that we would like to launch, and that requires capital investment. So, uh, so this is about building out and building the business, not about cashing out early investors. No, no, this is going to be mostly primary capital. Jason, we know the opportunity in the U.S. with all the major sports overseas, particularly in Europe, soccer is huge. What's the opportunity outside of the U.S. in a sport like that? Well, I definitely, I mean, sports betting has been around in Europe, Australia, and other parts of the world for a while, and there's regulation happening all over the globe right now. So we think longer term, this is a really exciting international opportunity. Our primary focus is going to be the United States, given, 
you know, really what we see is a market that's going to be rapidly developing. I think you guys, CNBC, had an article that 2020 will be the year of sports betting uh, yesterday or the day before. So, so if football is the number one sport on betting, what's number two and three? Basketball, you know, it depends, uh, it depends on the time of year. Um, you know, with so many uh, new states and growth, it's kind of hard to tell. But the big ones are football, basketball, baseball. College sports are quite large as well. Uh, and then golf, hockey, and some others are, are growing quite nicely. Uh, Jason, want to thank you for being with us today. It's really a pleasure having you here, and we hope on day one. Yeah, you'll come back and tell us more as this progresses. I would love thank to. You. Thank you. Yes. Happy holidays. We'll be watching the market's reception at nine thirty. It'll be interesting <laughs> yes. to see how the stock too. trades and how the warrants trade. And Okay, coming up uh, when we return, a lot more on Squawk. President Trump signing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act two years ago. Uh, one of the architects behind it, Art Laffer, is going to join us right after the break. But first, as we head to that break, check out what stocks have done since those tax cuts were put in place. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box right here on CNBC. Can you custom- You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. At Asda this Christmas, our whole basted turkey is just £4 a kilo. And our grower selection vegetables are only 20p per pack. Get a broccoli, one kilogram of carrots and 500 grams of parsnips or sprouts. Asda, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores subject to availability. Broccoli, 360 grams, ends 26th of December. Ho, 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 who's made a list this year? I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen? Listen to them through. Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. So it's already December 23rd. Right now, get three for two on Christmas gifts, plus save an extra 20% on selected products. So work your way through that Christmas list and save money on selected products from brands like Number 7, Soap and Glory, and Sanctuary. Get on it today at the What to Buy for Maximum Reaction at Minimum Cost Boutique at your nearest Boots in London White City Shopping Centre. So gift like you get them before it ends 24th of December at selected stores and boots.com. Cheapest item free. The puck drops. Twelve players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. Tune in brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. Whether you call yourself a Democrat, Republican, Independent, or something else... The road to 2020 is on tune in. Oh, what a it. night! It, and, and a, a complete earthquake. This was follow earthquake. every step of the Democratic primaries while hearing the latest headlines from the White House with live 24-hour news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox News Talk, and more. We're closing in on the first results in the battle for the White House. It is Experience be- the election through the sources you trust with the nonstop news channels on tune in. Welcome back to Squawk Box. Take a look at the futures this morning. Green arrows once again across the board. In fact, the Dow has been building with the gains we've been watching all morning. Right now, indicated up by about 80 points. S&P futures indicated up by 6.5, and and the NASDAQ up by about 25 points. This comes after all three of the major averages closed at new highs once again on Friday, and that seems to be kind of a broken record at this point. Um, Our guest host today, Tom Farley, is here, also Peter Bookvar. We've been watching what happens in the markets, and it's kind of been phenomenal to watch this build into the end of the year. Tom, you made the point earlier, it's the reverse of what was happening last year at this time. We looked at the markets going down every day on a daily basis, bottoming out on Christmas Eve, December 24th, on the half-day session. And I happened to be with you co-hosting on that day last year, and as you and I were doing during the commercial break, 
The S&P is up 38% since the intraday low that day. And then today, we've had multiple guests come on saying, everything's great. Earnings next year are going to grow 9%. The 18 PE could increase. It makes me a little nervous. Yeah. Last year at this time, every guest was saying, forget it. Don't get into this. This is a falling knife. Don't try and go. Right. <laughs> they were dead wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> A little nervous. Very festive a- 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 atmosphere here on the desk this morning. Uh, meantime, uh, yesterday marked two years since President Trump signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act for a look at how those tax cuts have impacted the markets. I want to bring in Art Laffer, Laffer Associates founder and chairman, and also co author of Trumponomics Inside the America First Plan to Revive Our Economy. Laffer served as an economic advisor during President Trump's campaign and, of course, is known as an architect of the president's economic platform and the Laffer Curve. Um, Mr. Laffer, good morning. It's good nice morning. to see you. How are you this morning? What a lovely day. What, what a, a lovely, lovely day. So day. we're two years after the tax cuts. We showed a screen right before we came into this, before we went to break, that showed that the markets were up. Do you know? Did you see the number? No. Did, were you no. looking? I didn't see the number. In, the, in two years? No, no, no. This, so this is markets rise since, uh, uh, since the Trump tax cuts. Dow up 15%. S&P, 20%, NASDAQ, 28%. And my question to you was what you think the natural um, the, the natural increase would have been without the tax cuts. Well, I think it would have been a lot less, to be honest with you. I think uh, one of the major things this tax cut did was increase uh, the stock market and the wealth of America. I think that's huge. I, I think the GDP growth has also been quite substantial from the tax cuts, tax revenues, I think are fine, running right in line. I think employment has been improved dramatically, and I think real wages have been increased substantially from the tax bill. So I'm very pleased with the results, and I look forward to a lot longer increases in prosperity from that tax bill. So to the extent that there are folks who say, look, some of this just pulled forward effectively, um, or was a one-time gain, do you think that's not real? No, I don't think it's real. I mean, what these people miss, by the way, on their tax revenues, which bothers me a lot, is there was a one-time fourth quarter 2017 uh, imputation of $250 billion in taxes from assets held abroad, from earnings held abroad. $250 billion, they all start their analysis on January 1st, 2018, but that's wrong. It really should be started in the fourth quarter of 2017, and if you look at that, Tax revenues are doing very well in the last two years relative to the prior two years. And and if you look at GDP growth, we have come down some on GDP growth. Very, very true. But when you look at us relative to the rest of the world, we've skyrocketed relative to the rest of the world. We're ahead of – if we'd have grown at the eurozone growth rate, which we were a little bit below before – we would be two and a half percentage points lower in GDP today than we are one and a quarter point a year ago. So that's about 700 plus billion additional GDP I attribute primarily to the tax bill. Or someone who is a proponent of lower taxes, as I am, what's your thought on using the tool of tariffs in approaching China and, and how we've dealt with trade with other countries? You know, that, that's a strategy question that I'm really not an expert on. I'm not a good negotiator, but it is a traditional tool that has been used from our founding fathers on. You know, trade is a very intricate, complicated, probably the most sophisticated area of economics. And uh, tariffs and uh, quotas have been used extensively to get countries to behave differently. And uh, we do it against North Korea. We do it against Zimbabwe, Iran, uh, all sorts of things. I'm a free trader quote, unquote, in almost all aspects. But uh, using these for negotiation is a very legitimate way of, of negotiating with other countries. Our, uh, of, of course, but I'm the no corporate, expert on how to do it. Of course, the corporate tax cuts help the economy. It's axiomatic that if you have uncompetitive rates and you go to having competitive rates, yes. it's going to be good for, for this Thank country. You. Why is it on the personal tax side that the president and the Republican Congress has not gotten credit for lowering personal taxes? Well, because they were overshadowed by the corporate. Uh, Very simply, we cut the corporate from 35 to 21. We went to territoriality on our tax stuff. We did all sorts of other uh, corporate ones, 100% expensing. uh, And all of that was really huge and really important and very needed. The the individual was from 39.6 to 37. And we had a couple of pass-throughs as well, uh, which were very injudiciously used politically. Uh, but, you know, it just was overshadowed. I think Although, that when the president's reelected, 
he'll he'll go to a much lower personal income tax rate and really reform the system. All right, it depends on on where you live for the personal income taxes too. In in, in blue states, yes, those on does. the coast. Um, a lot of those people are paying higher income taxes because of the change in the SALT deductions. Sure yeah. yeah, but we're paying less. I mean, here I am in a zero income tax state uh, with no earned or unearned income, and here I'm having to subsidize New York because they decide that they can pay Cuomo $100 and get a tax credit of forty dollars. I know, but if you go back to the return, if you go back to no the other side of that argument, I, I've listened to this debate a million times over the last two years. If you go to yep, the other side too, of the argument, it's that okay, states, uh, some of those red states are actually uh, taking money from the federal government versus uh, some of the blue states that are giving money to the federal treasury. Yeah, the, the government has never been meant to be balanced dollar for dollar by state that's never has or dollar to dollar by income class or by any other group. The state, the federal government spends its money in its best ways possible and collects its money in the most efficient way possible. And sometimes that leads to imbalances, but it shouldn't lead to imbalances on tax rates paid by equivalent conditioned people in different states. It just shouldn't. Okay, there should be no deductions for state, federal, state Art, and local taxes. Let, let me ask you a question. One of, one of the goals of, of the tax, at least the corporate side of this tax plan was to get corporations to repatriate, to bring uh, cash back to the United States. And I want to yeah. ask you about this. The president specifically had pledged the companies would bring back $4 trillion. That was the number uh, to beat. You look at the numbers thus far, and they have fallen short. They may well have fallen short. I haven't followed those numbers carefully, and I don't remember exactly what the president said. But what I do know is the taxes collected on those foreign uh, earnings held abroad was $250 billion collected taxes on those uh, on those foreign earnings, and that's uh, the revenue part. Just, just to, just to really put it in context, the for the great. full year of 2018, $664 billion had been brought back. When I say falling short, that's but, it. Well, can I just ask a question? Yeah. With all yeah, due respect, that's a very, who cares? That's a very large... Who cares? Why does that yeah, matter? Who, I mean, the tax revenue... Why does that, I, don't I don't understand about the tax why... Revenue. I don't care. I don't understand why don't when you rate. lower corporate tax rates, right. somehow that's a sop to billionaires. And if you don't have this exact amount of money coming back to the U.S. as was otherwise predicted, that's an but issue. No, because we no, now no. have yeah. competitive tax rates. And, I'm not, and our economy is doing great. Uh, and it, it, that's a great thing. The question is, is it doing all it's supposed to do? And Let, if you end, no, I'll tell you why. Because what you would have done, if you really cared about repatriating cash back, you would have come up with some kind of additional strategy that would have done something, either forced the money in, in certain ways or would have been at a different rate. I mean, there are things you would have done around that if that was the issue. And now, if you're saying I it's not those, the issue, it's I not think the that issue. would have been a mistake. I don't, I don't want I, the government to force. You know, company CEOs is exactly how they're going to. Or then just don't say that I'm doing this for this reason. Art, please Art, wait. Let, let me you. balance your arguments out. Yep. The huge trade deficit increases our capital flowing into this country. That's where you want it, is the real capital that provides jobs, output, employment. That trade deficit is the capital surplus, which is an enormous move of real resources into the United States to provide employment. Okay. What has happened with regard to the earnings abroad, we've collected the taxes on them. What more do you want? If they want to sit overseas after paying their taxes fair and square, God bless them. But the real benefit has been the trade right. deficit, bringing real capital right, back to the U.S. to provide jobs. we got to run. Wonderful. We want to wish you a very happy holiday. Hey, and always appreciate man, your thank time Thank you very much, and thanks for allowing thanks, me to, Art. to be on it, especially on this day. Thank See you, you in 2020. Thank you, Art. It's a deal. Our thanks, by the way, to Peter Bookbar. Thank thanks, you for guys. spending the hour with us. And we'll see you back here, too. Happy holidays. You, too. Six trading days left in 2019. Actually, five, if you consider two of those sessions are half-day sessions. We're going to tell you what investors need to be watching as we head into the new year this morning. Green arrows across the board. The Dow indicated up by 83 points. Stick around. You are watching Squawk Box right here on CNBC. Ah, Christmas, a time for sharing gifts and laughter, and photos and videos. Make the most of it with a SIM-only deal packed with data from Tesco Mobile. Like a 10-gig SIM for just £13 a month. It's just one of the ways we're celebrating 100 years of great value. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile today. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 29th of December. 12-month contract and unlocked 4G-enabled phone required. Terms apply. See tescomobile.com slash terms. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. 
There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. 19p. What will that get you at Christmas? Five minutes to Panto, a very unpopular secret Santa. This week at Tesco, you can get sprouts, carrots or parsnips from just 19p. Our festive three. That should get you on the nice list. Tesco, delivering Christmas for 100 years. Selected stores excludes Express ends 26th of December. As we play out the 2010s, tune in's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. Hello from the The 2010s saw yet another revolution in the way we listen to music. With music fans giving up CDs and digital downloads for streaming services and internet radio like TuneIn. At the same time, vinyl sales continue to rise to levels not seen since the format's original decline. Keep listening to TuneIn for more trends of the 2010s. Hi, I'm Tom Haberstroh, host of the Haberstroh Podcast. I'm partnering with TuneIn to answer a few questions and get you prepped for NBA Christmas Day. I wanted to start an NBA podcast because I wanted to take you behind the scenes and hear it from the people that make the NBA tick. It's the most intimate platform for the most intimate sport. And podcasts are the perfect medium to capture that intimacy. Search The Haber Show to listen to new episodes every Friday throughout the NBA season on TuneIn. NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. Tonight, TuneIn has your Monday night NFL football with the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Kickoff at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. Goes up, dart toward the end zone. Ball, 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 ball. Touchdown with a touchdown of the left corner. Bucks take the lead. Fire at home or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Boeing's difficult year continues. We're going to talk about reports of a tense meeting between Dennis Mullenberg and the FAA administrator. Plus, a mishap for Boeing Starliner spacecraft. We'll tell you what went wrong with the shuttle that's supposed to be taking astronauts to the moon and what went right. And a million-dollar view of the markets and the U.S. economy. I just I made you ten million dollars. <laughs> Exclusive data from CNBC's Millionaire Survey is straight ahead. The final hour of Squawk Box begins right now. everybody. Welcome back to Squawk Box here on CNBC. We are live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Becky Quick along with Andrew Ross Sorkin. Joe is out today, but joining us for the full three hours is Tom Farley. He is Farpoint Ventures CEO, also a CNBC contributor. Good to have you here. Great to be here. Got a lot to talk about. We also have a guest host with us for this hour, Joe Lavornia, who is Natixis Chief Economist. And Joe, it's good to see you. Thank you, Becky. Good to be here. The economy's been looking pretty good so far, and the market certainly reflects it. Looks great. People are coming around to that view. Yeah, they are coming around to that view. In fact, take a look at the futures this morning. You're going to see that uh, right now the Dow is indicated up by about 80 points. Also, the Nasdaq indicated up by 26, and then the S and P indicated up by six and a half. There have been talk. There's been talk about money kind of flooding back in. People are deciding not to fight the momentum that they've seen going for so many days. Markets all closed at new highs on Friday, and we are seeing some build to that uh, right now this morning, which is the opposite of what we were watching last year at this point, when the markets actually bottomed out on December 24th. Take a look at what's been happening in the Treasury market today. We've been yielding around two percent, or just below that. For for the 10-year, which is now right now sitting at 1.917 percent, the 30-year at 2.338 percent, and then the two-year at 1.6 percent. Okay. Activist uh, hedge fund uh, Mercado Capital Management is shutting down. The fund is backed by Blackstone Group and billionaire Bill Ackman. Sources telling CNBC its assets have shriveled after two years of poor returns. The firm's founder and portfolio manager, Richard McGuire, began telling investors of that decision to return outside capital late last week. He expects to send the money back quickly because the portfolio is now largely in cash. Guar had been selling positions over the last months to meet redemption requests. A spokesman for Mercado declined to comment. Also, interesting story. It is. 
Please. on a year, uh, two years, which were pretty bullish years. And some of the well-known activists, Elliot or Third Point, my colleague uh, Dan, Dan Lowe, his firm, they, they've been generating really good returns in that activist segment. Right. And that's one of the areas that hasn't been suffering quite as much as other long, short hedge funds. Right. We should also tell you, Senator Chuck Schumer is taking on TJX. He says that the discount retailers sold recalled and potentially dangerous products to unsuspecting customers for years. He is calling for a thorough investigation of the company, which owns not only TJ Maxx, but also Marshalls and Home Goods. Senator Schumer says that over the last five years, TJX sold 19 items that were recalled for safety reasons. That list includes electronic hoverboards that can sometimes catch on fire or explode. He says TJX ignored recall notices and continued to profit from the devices. Schumer sent a letter to the Consumer Product Safety Commission and is calling on TJX to alert consumers to any dangers and issue refunds. In a statement, TJX says that the products were mistakenly left on the shelves and that it is working to ensure this doesn't happen again. Okay, Boeing Starliner is back on Earth after a test that uh, was marred by an orbital error that prevented it from docking with the International Space Station. Morgan Brennan joins us right now. She is at the desk, on the desk, yes. after being... Right there in, in the Cape, Cape Canaveral, right? Yeah, they're uh, live and on the ground for the launch on Friday morning. The launch itself went well. The issues happened after right. this Starliner spacecraft got to space. So 7.58 a.m. Eastern on Sunday, yesterday morning, Boeing's unmanned Starliner touched down at the Army's White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Successful ending to a botched mission in which it failed to dock the International Space Station, hurtling at 25 times the speed of sound, uh, about a mile above Earth, in the dark, three parachutes deployed. This is a procedure that challenged Boeing in the past, so it was key to see that happen. Starliner became the first American-made human-rated orbital capsule to land on land. Big question now, what happens next? The malfunction on Friday was software-based, specifically a clock error. Still on a call yesterday, a Boeing official saying once they gather all the data, they expect 85 to 90 percent of test objectives to have been fulfilled. So what does this mean for humans getting aboard? Well, expect analysis to take weeks, if not months. Then NASA debates whether Starliner needs another test without crew, which, given the fixed price contract, Boeing would presumably pay for. <coughs> Meantime, experts say this puts SpaceX, which is also a NASA's commercial crew program, in the lead, depending on its own key safety test next month, to become the first to take astronauts from U.S. soil to space in more than eight years. You said it was a clock issue, which is meaning a clock that issue. the internal clock wasn't set on the right time so the boosters went off at the wrong time or something? Yeah, so there, so, so a, it was a timing error, a clock error, and what essentially happened was um, the automated system within Starliner basically reaches down into the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket to gauge the timing and link up. Apparently it was off by 11 hours. What? So that's part of the reason I think that this didn't show up in simulations and why this was so unexpected. They don't but it's know such a yet stupid thing what to have caused wrong. it. That poor developer. So frustrating. I know, which is why I think... Not a problem with any of the systems, just a timing. Exactly, exactly. Oh, so and this is also, I think, why NASA and Boeing have said that if astronauts were on board, this issue could have been seen and rectified pretty right, quickly that they and why they would have been That's what I wondered at the time. If somebody was actually ISS. manually there to override this, could this have been prevented? I think the most important part was that the landing came in safely right. on Sunday. You were able to take off and land with no risk to anybody who would have been on board. It was, it was to use Jim Bridenstine, the administrator of NASA's words, an absolute bullseye. Two most important parts of a space mission where humans are involved, the launch and the landing. Both of those actually went right, which is why I think this is even up for debate right now on whether a second uncrewed test is going to be necessary. What do you think is going to happen? You want to handicap it? What do I think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Oh, I think, again, this depends on SpaceX's own test. Uh, in January, I think SpaceX could potentially, uh, based on where we're at right now, be the first, uh, again, to bring, to bring humans into low Earth orbit. But I think it's a very strong likelihood that both of these companies will be doing that next year. The one other thing I would say in all of this, and NASA, the NASA administrator said this to me when we spoke uh, in Squawk Alley on Friday, is that I think this also now pushes NASA to look at other potential companies who could come into this program too, whether it's Lockheed Martin with Orion or maybe sure. Sierra Nevada Corporation, which is the other private billionaire-backed Right. commercial space company. All right, let's bring in Sheila Kailu. She is aerospace and defense analyst at Jefferies. She has a buy rating and a $420 price target on Boeing. And Sheila, what did you think as you were watching this happen on Friday? 
Just um, culminating a year of not so great news for Boeing. I mean, I think what's successful is the launch was successful, the landing was successful. It, it was an autonomous capsule, so if there was astronauts on board, it would have been p potentially successful. And I think it goes to show that this is the commercial crew program trying to take astronauts to, sp uh, to the International Space Station. There's only two providers. There's a reason why there's only two commercial OEMs out there, Boeing and Airbus, and there's a handful of defense primes. These development programs are difficult. SpaceX has encountered its own hurdles and own delays. So naturally, these, these timelines are difficult. Who do you think's in the lead right now between SpaceX and Boeing, just based on what's happened now, what's to come? Well, right SpaceX's uh, final abort flight test is, a, I think, scheduled for January 11th. So they look to be in the lead. If um, that goes well. If that goes well. But it seems to be the final test. So potentially, we could get astronauts in to ISS by the second half or the first half. Uh, to Morgan's point, in terms of what's happening in terms of who else this might lure into the space. Do you think that there could be other entrants who will now look at this and say, okay, this gives us room for entry? It does, but we don't know if SpaceX is making money on the commercial uh, crew program. So that's one thing. That's partially why their costs are lower than Boeing. Um, so it has to be somebody that's billionaire-backed. Uh, it can't be a startup with billions of dollars. Because uh, you'll run out of money. Yeah. Sheila, when I... I just wrote down the list of the failed missions. So SpaceX has had failed missions, Blue Origin, NASA, Virgin Galactic. Is Boeing, is this a bit of piling on for Boeing? I mean, this was a big story. My Twitter feed was full of it over the weekend. Perhaps it was your reporting. Uh, <laughs> but is this an even bigger story because Boeing is Boeing at this moment in time with such a tough 2019? I think if the MAX was not grounded, this would have been overshadowed, and it would have been, you know, NASA was hesitant to call it a failure and was looking into it, so I think it would have been just a glimpse and not as big of a story. As I it. also think that part of the reason this got as much attention as it did, right or wrong, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, deserved or not, the fact that this was an automation or software issue, malfunction, also seemed to raise some eyebrows within the aerospace community. Look, we, we might not have noticed this if you weren't down there for the launch watching. Right. I mean, it was, it was highly publicized. People yes. were watching and were all around it. We watched you as it took off. We were coming back to you, and we were able to go to you as soon as there were problems. There have been problems with some of the other ones that weren't so well documented because there, wa there, there wasn't the same there, sort of media Yeah, commercial, the commercial crew program is three years behind its, its uh, you know, initial schedule, and that's the reason is because there have been budget delays, and then there have been issues with development of both of these spacecraft along the way which I think is also why the fact that you had those three parachutes actually deploy successfully in this uh, Starliner land as smoothly as it did yesterday was seen as very important because there have been issues with that in the past. Right. Sheila, you started this conversation by saying this cap's a really rotten year for Boeing with a lot of terrible headlines. You've got a buy rating and a $420 price target. What has to happen for that to be correct? And by the way, is that a 12-month price target you're It's looking a 12-month price target. Uh, you know, we see a turbulent ride, but we see the stock above 400 a year from now. Because I, I think you have to assume the max flies. And one thing that was overshadowed last week was the EU regulator uh, was thinking about a February timeline back into entry into service. So that didn't get as much news flow as the Starliner, but I thought that was positive that the EU was almost leading the discussion. Although we have seen so much uh, turbulence in the relationship with the FAA at this point, and, and the new <coughs> administrator there who basically is saying it's, it, it's going to be on our timeline and stop pushing us on any of those things. Right. I think... The FAA and Boeing have struggled on Boeing being potentially overly optimistic. I think that's clear to say. Um, but what's good news is we haven't seen any new technical updates, any software updates that have to be made. It just seems that the FAA wants to lead the discussion, and FAA will also certify every aircraft that comes off the line, something that was previously delegated to, the, to Boeing let, to do. Let me ask you what may seem like a crazy question. If the 737 MAX never flies again, what does that mean to your price target? Stock is worth 275 on a DCF, assuming the max doesn't go away. This $100 billion company, the max accounts for $35 billion of revenue. So there's still a defense business. There's the rest of Boeing Commercial, which includes the 787 Joe, what, would they re what would they replace the 737 max with, assuming the military buys it and it doesn't come back into commercial use? You could go back to the previous version, which is the 737NG. Uh, so the max is an update to that right. NG. Uh, what I think will happen is they're... 
you could do that. I think the likelihood of that is a 1% shot um, of the MAX never flying in, into the air again because we haven't seen any bad news in terms of technical updates, additional software that has to be made. Sheila, I think you just made a really key point, and that is if the FAA is now individually certifying, certifying every aircraft instead of Boeing and doing it on behalf of them, what that's going to mean to the massive backlog we have of planes that are parked all over the country right now. I mean, you've had a production halt, so Boeing's producing this 42 to 52 a month, so you've had 400 aircraft pile up into inventory. So the question is, you don't want to give airlines these aircraft two to three years out, so you might want to get rid of that inventory as quickly as possible, and clearly it's going to slow down the process if there's FAA individuals certifying everything that comes Bill Bo has made the point that they may do that at the beginning, but then they may actually give it back to Boeing after they are satisfied that it's working the way they think. We'll see. Um, Sheila, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good to see you. Great to see you. Coming up when we return, DraftKings striking a deal to become a publicly traded company, announcing just in the last hour. We're going to talk to former TiVo CEO Tom Rogers. He's got a new company that's betting big on live sports. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box on CNBC. I love you, Dad. A what? These 40 short seconds are all it takes to enter your details into timetofind.com and locate the perfect Swiss watch. Browse and tell them which of the many thousands of watches you want to buy. They'll then put the word out to authorized retailers who'll let you know when they found it, usually within 24 hours. There's an optional concierge service too, and even a seasonal £50 off your first luxury Swiss watch purchase. Save precious time at timetofind.com. £50 off first order only. Terms and conditions apply. At Asda this Christmas, our whole basted turkey is just £4 a kilo. And our grower selection vegetables are only 20p per pack. Get a broccoli, one kilogram of carrots and 500 grams of parsnips or sprouts. Asda, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores subject to availability. Broccoli, 360 grams, ends 26th of December. Ho, 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 who's made a list this year? I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through. Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus. Offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! Hand off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Hi, I'm Tom Haberstroh, host of the Haberstroh Podcast. I'm partnering with TuneIn to answer a few questions and get you prepped for NBA Christmas Day. I wanted to start an NBA podcast because I wanted to take you behind the scenes and hear it from the people that make the NBA tick. It's the most intimate platform for the most intimate sport. And podcasts are the perfect medium to capture that intimacy. Search The Haber Show to listen to new episodes every Friday throughout the NBA season on TuneIn. Well, this is a complicated deal. It's a three-way merger. Um, we looked at different options for financing it, and this one made a lot of sense because it allowed us to both secure capital up front through a pipe that would then be, uh, be used to complete the acquisition of SB Tech. Yes. Well, they, we raised an additional pipe as well. which so 300 yeah, plus million dollars. Yeah, by Cap Research, one. Franklin Templeton, Wellington, several other great ones. And uh, then we also, you know, wanted to get public sometime in 2020, ideally. And uh, this allowed us to do both of them in the same uh, transaction as opposed to two separate transactions. So- that was the CEO of DraftKings speaking about the company's deal to go public uh, literally in the past hour. Joining us right now to talk about the big business of live sports and betting, Tom Rogers, executive chairman at Winview and a CNBC contributor. What serendipity to have you on on the same day that this DraftKings deal actually happens? I have another three-way deal to talk about. I know. It covers similar territory, but in other ways very, very different. So I want to get, get to your deal in one second, but right. I just want to get your thoughts now that you've heard that this deal is out in public? 
Well, it's been rumored for a while, so right. I'm not surprised by it. Uh, surprised it was done as a SPAC? Uh, well, that had been rumored for a while, too. Uh, Jeff Zagansky's right. uh, been uh, uh, involved with all that for some time. Uh, really uh, interesting to see uh, sports gambling uh, gaining the amount of traction that it is. And uh, we have a couple of uh, themes that relate to that right. in terms of our deal. One, we have a massive patent portfolio co uh, covering mobile sports betting and mobile sports gambling. Uh, CNBC had an article out, as Jason referred to today, with about 20 states that have legalized gambling. Only about seven or eight of those are active with mobile sports. Mm -hmm. That's where most of DraftKings and FanDuel's growth is coming from. And are, do, they, do they have to pay you for patents? Well, we haven't talked about specific companies and uh, our licensing program, but uh, we are quite confident with all the people that have looked at our patents that we have a major role to play in terms of mobile sports gambling. What is, but what is the, the patent piece that's the most valuable? Well, what's uh, fascinating about uh, our patent portfolio is it goes to the heart of people watching at home and betting mobile sports gambling. And uh, imagine you're watching via satellite, I'm watching via cable, uh, Becky's watching via streaming. We all have different times, different latencies that the picture of what's going on on the football field arrives at our television set. Right. And to have a game of integrity, you need to synchronize everybody with their picture in the right time sequence. That's and then really lock everybody out simultaneously. That's or a people really can cheat point. the I've system. Never, I've never thought and that. we have key patents that go to the heart of making sure sports gambling via mobile or sports gaming or what I'm going to talk about in a minute, esports gaming, right. is all done with the kind of integrity you need. Can I ask you for that? Is it the DraftKings company? Is it the, the league? who? Because if I were the league, I'd want to make sure nobody was gaming it. Well, we have these uh, patents that uh, we have been uh, lining up our licensing program. and uh, But here's the part I don't understand. Various Let's parties. say I'm uh, watching it at home on a... a Spectrum Cable, right, uh, or Comcast, parent company to this network, right, and somebody else is, as you said, watching it on streaming on this and watching right. somewhere else. How could you, if I can see it, how could you lock that? I could, I understand if you were, we were all on the same device. I get that, but if I could get the information else, or by the way, if I'm live. Well, in the actual stadium. That, that, that is the key to it. You have to be able to know when, uh, in a way that you are uniformly locking out how much time people have to enter relative to when they've seen something so people can't get that information first, then make the bet. Right. So you're locking out people simultaneously. You, it's critically important to the you whole know what, You know what this works. is? I lived this for six years. This With is trading. high That's frequency trading. trading. Right. Exactly. But by the way, in your world, people <clears throat> could pay to get a little faster stream. Just like in this world, you can show up at the game. You want to be as close to the action as possible. In the old but days, okay, so the see, but are you going to lock people who are in the stadium out? The same thing. Uh, yeah. in, in, you 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 deal with this in terms of people who are in the live stadium being able to uh, measure sequences and knowing your delay relative to. Uh, uh, the the fastest and slowest delivery systems that you're you're dealing with. You know what's it's interesting is the Fed right. is worried about this with in terms of uh, speeches, and there's a big issue now with the Bank of England, mm -hmm. where this one service right. was paying to get people information like seconds before right. it was released. Because anytime but, there's money on the line, it's unbelievable. Game the yeah. system. That's but let me let me tell you how what we're doing is, while it covers sports gambling. You're really doing with esports. We're, we're dealing with sports gaming of a different sort, including esports. What WinView does is does this as predictive gaming, game of skill. Games of skill, uh, as Jason's other business, fantasy sports, which is legal in about 85% of the country, predictive games of skill are largely legal as well, where you're not betting on a single proposition, uh, how many yards is the next uh, play going to uh, mm. involve, but you are... Uh, getting 20 or 25 questions in a social context where you're playing against friends and family or you're playing against 20 people in an anonymous room and people are playing for a pot of money based on paid entry. They may enter a room that costs them $2 to enter, maybe $100 to enter. That, we believe, is going to go way beyond the hardcore gambler into much more social viewing. you got 200 million sports viewers right. in this country. And a small portion of them will be gamblers. Are you, getting, but running, are you running a consumer product or the enterprise sort of piece of it behind the scenes? Uh, we both. are uh, both. It's a 
both the technology that drives it as well as the uh, uh, direct-to-consumer engagement that uh, makes all that happen. But we are putting three companies together also. As you mentioned, one of them is Torque Esports to bring this competitive platform to esports. Another is, frankly, in news to create the flip side answer to all the streaming we've talked about, entertainment programming is going to uh, streaming. What happens to news and sports content when the bundle declines and the sub fees that are supporting news and sports go with it? Engine, esports, and news, G Gaming is about creating the revenue support for the news and sports programming that's okay, left behind. Well, I want to talk to you more about that, but we got to go for now, but you're going to have to come on back. You're here all week. I am here all week. Okay, we're going to come find you. Thank all you, right. Tom. Great good to see you. you. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you. When we come back, protests in Hong Kong erupting into violence again last night. We will tell you what the demonstrators have planned for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Hi, Phil Swift here. I've always loved a kitchen experiment, especially smoothies. I've blended all sorts of mad combinations, strawberry and charcoal, broccoli and chocolate. Not my best, that. But when I test blenders in the Witch Lab, it's not about flavour, it's about performance. Our tests use proper tough stuff, hard ice, strong veg, rough nuts. And the blenders that can hack it are the only ones we recommend for your kitchen. Witch tests harder so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. Ho, ho, ho. Who's made a list this year? I want a new phone. One with amazing cameras, ultra-wide lens, of course, live focus video. Well, it has to be 5G ready to stream all my films. Can it come with something awesome to listen to them through? Darling, I think he was talking to the kids. Get everything you want and more. Purchase a Samsung 5G ready device and claim a pair of silver wireless Galaxy Buds at no extra cost. Shop our 5G handsets in store or online at your local O2 store or o2.co.uk. 18 plus. Offer excludes Galaxy Fold 5G. Purchase by the 25th of the 12th, 19. Claim from Samsung within 30 days. T's and C's apply. On the goal Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. Here's Petrangelo, he scores! And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. The move, and a shot, he scores! From regular season action to the All-Star game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Looks the end zone. Touchdown underneath the NFL fans, hear every live game on TuneIn Premium. Tonight, TuneIn has your Monday night NFL football with the Green Bay Packers at the Minnesota Vikings. Kickoff at 8.15 p.m. Eastern. Goes up, dart toward the end zone. Caught, ball, caught, ball. Touchdown with a touchdown in the left corner. Bucks take the lead. Fire at home game. or on the go, hear the home and away call of every NFL game this season on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Hey, NFL fan, can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards... At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Hong Kong is bracing for more violence. Christmas Eve protests are planned for five shopping malls, followed by more demonstrations on Christmas Day in multiple districts. This past weekend was filled with rallies, including one yesterday that ended in chaotic clashes between mass demonstrators and police. We are well past six months of these demonstrations at this point. Okay, coming up uh, when we return, we got some breaking economic data to bring you on this holiday week. We're going to get the latest durable goods numbers. That's going to come in just a couple minutes. Plus, a million-dollar view in the markets and the economy. We've got new data from CNBC's exclusive millionaire survey, and you've got to hear the results. All that straight ahead. TuneIn is remembering the biggest college sports moments of the decade, like this one from 2018, when Texas kicker Cameron Dicker nails the game-winning field goal in the Red River Showdown against Oklahoma. A 40-yard field goal try. Good snap and hold. The kick on its way, and the kick is good! It's good! Dicker, the kicker, comes through, and with nine seconds... Search College Sports on TuneIn to be there for the moments that go down in history. Hello, 
I'm Nat Coombs from ESPN's The Nat Coombs Show, which admittedly is 1 out of 10 for original podcast name, but 10 out of 10 for NFL chat. Every week, we're dropping four episodes with an all-pro lineup of terrific guests, journalists, comedians, players, coaches, you name it, all getting you up to speed with everything gridiron. The Nat Coombs Show, American football, British accent. Add to your favorites and listen on TuneIn. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. That's why I need a one dance. The 2010s was the decade of the surprise album drop. I see it, I want it. Where artists from Beyonce, Drake, and Frank Ocean to Radiohead, U2, and the late David Bowie skipped the traditional promotion cycle to bring their music directly to fans with little to no warning. I Keep listening to tune in for more trends of the 2010s. Want tune in to remind you when the big NFL game is about to get underway? Be sure notifications are allowed on your phone and search NFL on the TuneIn app. Find the game you want to hear under events and tap notify me. We'll let you know exactly when it's time to listen in for kickoff. Start hearing more of what you want. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations, live commercial-free news, and every live NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL game. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. As we wave goodbye to the 2010s, TuneIn is remembering some of the decade's biggest news stories. In 2011, the Arab Spring sparks anti-government protests across the Middle East and Northern Africa. In 2016, the United Kingdom votes to leave the European Union, forcing the ongoing Brexit crisis. And in 2019, Hong Kong erupts in six months of pro-democracy protest against mainland China. Search news on TuneIn to be there when the next big story breaks. Welcome back to Squawk Box. Holiday week. First of the data points. We're looking at our November preliminary on durable goods orders. It is out. It is down 2%. Not nearly what we were expecting. We were looking for a number in the area of up 1.5% sequentially. The final number gets downgraded from 0.5 to 0.2. Well, we can tell what it, the negative aspects of that headline were because once you strip out transportation, you are unchanged and last month, we lost two-tenths from up half 1% to up only three-tenths. Let's look at capital goods orders, non-defense X aircraft. Business spending is the big topic this year. Maybe it'll be a big topic next year. This is the proxy. It was up one-tenth of 1%. It's following up 1.1, which was a strong number, and it's unrevised. If we look towards shipments, down three-tenths. And a revision, lost a tenth from eight-tenths down to seven tenths. We still have new home sales coming out for November and interest rates, well, they're a little bit lofty globally in treasuries as well, but they haven't broken through that resistance ceiling in the low to mid 190s. Becky, back to you. Rick, thank you. And you are also wearing red. Happy holidays. Uh -huh. Merry Christmas if I don't see you again you before, too. okay? Uh, you and your family, thank you. <coughs> thank you. You and your family too, Rick. There is a new CNBC survey this morning giving us a snapshot at how millionaires are thinking about everything from markets and the economy to taxes and politics. Robert Frank joins us with the headlines on that. Robert, good morning. Good morning, Becky. American millionaires heading into the new year a little more cautious about markets and the economy, and they say the biggest risk to their wealth is Washington. A third of millionaires say the economy will be the same next year, while just under 40% say it will be weaker. That's according to the CNBC Millionaire Survey, which polls 760 Americans with investable assets of more than $1 million. And millionaires have grown more pessimistic since the summer, and their forecasts for stocks have come down. Over 40% say the S&P will be flat to down in 2020, while only 16% say it will be up more than 10%. Now, most are expecting investment returns of between just 2 and 6%. Now, the biggest risk next year, yep, politics. 40% said government dysfunction is the biggest risk to the economy next year. It's also the biggest risk to their personal wealth, with only 8% expecting higher taxes next year. Now, like the rest of America, millionaire views about the economy and markets depend a lot on their political party rather than their wealth levels. About two-thirds of Democratic millionaires say the economy will be weaker and that the S&P will be flat to down. Nearly two-thirds of Republican millionaires say the market will be up at least 5% next year. 
Uh, Joe Lavornia is here. Uh, Joe, just looking at this from the economics perspective, what do you think of how the millionaires are feeling about these things? And what do you think about the durable goods numbers we just saw, too? The data that, that Rob was showing tells me that there's going to be FOMO, right? I mean, it's in the positioning in Fair the market. Out. Yeah, the market is, seems to me, the, if you want to make the assumption the millionaires are, are perhaps more financially astute, uh, they've been underweight risk. They're probably going to chase the market higher. We haven't had that euphoria. Retail hasn't really been a big driver of equity returns. A lot of money is going, going into bonds. There's pessimism. People worried about politics. The durable goods data look lousy. But manufacturing will recover. There's a lot of evidence to suggest it's bottoming. And when that happens, you're going to get uh, CapEx to turn around. And I, I'm actually very bullish on growth next year and think we could do 3%, which would be the best of the cycle. All right, let's uh, continue this conversation. Speaking of millionaires, let's talk high-end housing. Douglas Element, president and COO, Scott Durkin is here. Uh, Scott, based on what Robert just said, based on what Joe just added to that, what's the outlook for real estate when you consider some of those wealthiest people are the ones who are a little concerned about things right now? Well, we're, we're finding the wealthy people are moving around. What so, for instance, they're Leaving looking... New York and New Jersey and Connecticut? Yeah. Yeah. Headed for you... states like Florida. Florida and Texas. Right. So we're seeing a lot of migration. Is that directly because of the tax changes that happened two years ago today? Yes, the salt, the but elimination of that. When, when you look at real estate and the stock market, there is one common denominator with the wealthy right now, which is that they're really waiting for the risk to subside. So in the market, uh, I'm sure you see, they're holding a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's record levels or near record levels. Mm -hmm. In Real estate is a similar thing where there's, there's a lot of inventory, but there's a lot of wealthy people just sitting on the sidelines waiting for things to get a lot worse before they can jump in. That sounds like the FOMO point that Joe was making. Like they've missed out. They have not participated in these rallies right. that have taken place. But that doesn't necessarily mean to me, and, and, and tell me on the real estate side, that they're going to jump back in next year. I, I, I think they're waiting for <clears throat> better levels in the market and in real estate. Although in the, in the builder sentiment last week showed a record high reading. It's at a 20-year high, but depends what region you're talking about. Right. The builders historically in the last five years have built luxury housing. They haven't built first entry level housing. So Why? We hear a lot of reasons about why. What do you, what do you hear? Well, I think there was more money up at that end. And, and yeah. post-mortgage crisis, the, the first time buyer was, was not a, a having trouble qualifying. having yeah. qualifications, as well as the millennials were stalled in buying their first home. Now they've come back into the fray. We've got that. And the baby boomers aren't leaving. So they're, they, they used to sell in about eight years. Now it's about 13 years that they're holding on. And by the way, the cost of building in New York between land and materials, $5,000 per square foot is the break even for a lot of these new buildings. So, you know, it has, to, it has to be a right. big luxury building to sell at six, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 square okay, foot. Okay, that, that's interesting. That's why we have not seen any of the entry level stuff that takes correct. place here. All the things that we, you bring us are correct. like 10,000. We always say that the dirt's too expensive. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it really Yogi is. Bear, it's like it's so crowded, nobody goes there anymore. Right, right. The, the, the Saudis and the Chinese don't feel as welcome here anymore. People like Carl Icahn are moving to Florida. Are some of these big buildings up the street here? going to be losers for the real estate developers, the ones that have 30, 50, 100 million dollars well, price Street. tags? 50, the billionaires row, I mean, Knight Frank, who's our partner internationally, had, had, had named that the most expensive street in the world, it's 57th Street. I think there's a lot to choose from, but what we're noticing now, and Robert's probably finding this, is that the market sort of self-corrected in the last quarter here with prices coming down. Aspirational selling is, is out. If you're priced right, people will come and buy it. And right. we found that the end of the third quarter was just terrible. We but will the developers make enough money? The developers, at the point of, of making enough money, it's a good question mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their financing and their loans out on the property. But we're still seeing, we just sold an enormous apartment at 111 West 57th Street, which is, is the Steinway building. And, and that's What was the sticker on that one? 28.5 28, for 4,400 square feet. We talk about New York a lot. How, how does right. California fit into this mix? Well, California and New York are getting hit in a way that um, Florida and Texas are, are benefiting because the, the real estate taxes, and they never go down. So we're having an issue with that, and people are, are leaving and becoming uh, homesteaders. And Although Texas California and just had three sales this year, yes. including two more seasons, at $100 million or more. 
and we just had one in New York this year, which was Ken Griffin at two two hundred thirty eight million. Those are like but crazy that was, outliers, right? But that was signed three years ago. Right. So oh. it's a weird thing where California should be seeing a salt effect, but and they are sort of at the ten to fifty million dollars, but they, they have seen these three big trades at the top would suggest that money is still coming there and, and maybe money that's... is and what we're finding is they're skipping New York and heading to California especially the international buyer why is that it's a good question I think all, I think it has to do with the, the density here as well as the weather the lifestyle the lifestyle it's, it's, a, it's a much better mm, lifestyle New York California but that's always been the case though right I mean just why now though I guess well we're seeing a lot of vertical living in California we sold out the Edition Hotel in, in West Hollywood, overlooking L.A., and it's been a, a huge success. More international in California is yeah. what I see. The Chinese and Saudis are still buying there in a big way. All the, you know, Emir of Qatar, they, they love it out there. New York, I just don't think they feel as welcome. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, the asset price inflation that we have seen, which the wealthy feel and see more than any other group, I think they've gotten nervous about that, whether you're talking about stocks or real estate. Yeah. Robert, thank you very much. Thank Scott, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Good to see you. Great to be here. Okay, coming up, uh, we're going to talk tech stocks when we return with a guest who just raised his price target on Amazon. I love you, Dad. You know it's out there somewhere, but you just keep missing out. I'm talking about your dream job. Now it's easier to find and land your next role with the LinkedIn app. Build connections, keep in touch, and be the first to hear about new jobs. LinkedIn has more openings than applicants. And sometimes all it takes is one LinkedIn connection to land the job that's right for you. Don't miss out. Get your next big break and find the job meant for you. Download the free LinkedIn app today. TuneIn is remembering the biggest college sports moments of the decade. Like this one from 2018. When Texas kicker Cameron Dicker nails the game-winning field goal in the Red River Showdown against Oklahoma. A 40-yard field goal try. Good snap and hold. The kick on its way. And the kick is good! It's good! Dicker, the kicker, comes through, and with nine seconds... Search college sports on TuneIn to be there for the moments that go down in history. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. The The 2010s saw yet another revolution in the way we listen to music. With music fans giving up CDs and digital downloads for streaming services and internet radio like TuneIn. At the same time, vinyl sales continue to rise to levels not seen since the format's original decline. Keep listening to TuneIn for more trends of the 2010s. As we wave goodbye. 2010s, TuneIn is remembering some of the decade's biggest news stories. In 2011, the Arab Spring sparks anti-government protests across the Middle East and Northern Africa. In 2016, the United Kingdom votes to leave the European Union, forcing the ongoing Brexit crisis. And in 2019, Hong Kong erupts in six months of pro-democracy protest against mainland China. Search news on TuneIn to be there when the next big story breaks. Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. The futures have been higher all morning long. In fact, it looks like we've been building on those gains most of the morning. Right now, indicated up for the Dow futures by about 83 points. NASDAQ futures up by about 34, and the S&P futures up by just over 8 points. 
Okay, tech has been one of the big winners of the year with the sector up almost 47%. But what can investors expect from the biggest names in the new year? Joining us right now is John Freeman. He's vice president of equity research and, and CFRA. And uh, Dan Ives of Webbush Securities out with a new note, raising his price target on Apple. Highest on the street, $350. Let's go there first. Yeah, Milligan, in our opinion, I think we're only halfway there through what I believe is a super cycle. I mean, our checks in terms of Asia continue to show not just iPhone 11, but right. China overall ahead of expectations. And I think it's a drum roll into 5G and a re-rating of the stock. So I, I, many will say, okay, the stock's up 75% right. year to date. I think only halfway through. That's why I think 350 is the next when stop. You, so 5G is the next thing that everyone's waiting on. The question is, do you believe there will be a 5G phone come fall 2020? Yeah, I mean, we just came back on, on our China trip, and we believe you'll have four phones that will at least be 5G enabled. And the key, the key question right now is, of the install base, you have right. 350 million. That's in the window of an upgrade opportunity. I view 5G as open up the floodgates right. for the next, uh, what I view as a super cycle. Well, can I ask one other question later, then I want to get to John. On the 5G piece, this enabled idea is actually very interesting because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to maybe want the enabled version. But if 5G is not really meaningfully available, except in major cities, will people actually upgrade next year? Or do they say 2021 is my year when the, when the full network might have a better shot at being out? I actually think full network around the country in a meaningful way could be a, a 2022 project. And I think right now, when you look at it, I think you have to look at Apple as there's going to be a two parts of the upgrade. You have the 2020, 2021. What I love about the super cycle thesis is right now about a third of the install base, they have not upgraded their phones in 39 months. So we're going into what's going to be a super cycle. And I think you'll, you could have a mix of 4G, 5G, but that's right now what I love about the setup in Apple and a re-rating of the stock, even though the skeptics continue. Meaning you're going to get a multiple. You get a multiple. What kind of service. multiple expansion? So to me, it's really the services business right. today. I think it's worth $500 billion. Can, can I just, I get nervous when I hear American tech company and China, and part of your, your part of your thesis is growth in China. You don't see risk there of Apple getting boxed out eventually if this trade war conversation goes awry? Yeah, and that's definitely been a black cloud, and no doubt that's, that's been a worry of investors. But I think you look at it today, about 60 to 70 million iPhones in China are coming up for an upgrade opportunity. If they're able to convert half of those, it's a success. So no doubt, definitely headwinds in China. But if you look what's baked into numbers here, that's what I love about the setup for Apple going into Europe. Hey, John, you've been waiting patiently. What do you make of uh, Dan's call here? Well, you know, I, uh, I, I, I actually am uh, fairly bullish on, on Apple as well. I think their, their strategy uh, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, point more towards services is actually the right one for them. Um, I'd like to see a little more innovation from the company, but uh, no, in general, I think, I think that's, a, I think that's a, a, the right call. Um, let me ask you about Tesla. I don't know if you saw this uh, Reuters report just crossing the wires right now. Tesla to take a $1.4 billion loan from Chinese banks for Shanghai factory. This is according to, uh, to Reuters. I don't know if we can get a Tesla st stock chart up there. It's actually up, uh, it looks like, maybe directly on that news. John, you have a take on this? Yeah, you know, it's um, – <laughs> I'm not really uh, – I, I don't really know about Tesla. I mean, I could go back and forth. I think their technology is amazing. I think the opportunity is fantastic. But, you know, they, they've got to get to a certain degree of scale um, and, and really turn, you know, turn the profitability knob on. Uh, otherwise, I think it's a little speculative. I think it's, it's a very speculative investment at this point. Yeah, I mean, yep. fundamentally, Giga 3, is the, that's the big growth thesis. The financing piece was the missing piece in the puzzle. The bulls will view this definitely as a positive. It just shows Giga 3 ahead of expectations in terms of that RAM. So right. it is a positive in terms of well, that. Well, it demonstrates bull. they can actually they still have access to the capital markets when that's I mean, the, in a big, big way. And especially in China, if you look at Giga 3 right now, that's the key to the bull thesis right now. So if you look at with this piece as well as demand, it's a positive in terms of what you're seeing on Tesla. John, you've, you've made a call on Oracle that, that you've recommended that they split the database business from the applications businesses. Uh, exactly. just, know, just knowing a little bit about Oracle, they, they, they haven't really done spinoffs at all or sold assets, so it seems unlikely. Oh, uh, I do, know. You, do you think it's possible? And if it's not possible, what do you think of Oracle with the uh, sad passing of, of Mark Hurd? 
So yeah, um, we have a cell on Oracle. I, I downgraded to, to to a cell because uh, primarily because they're they're just not. Uh, they're, they're way earlier in their shift to the cloud business and the database business uh, and, and their on-premise uh, applications business. I think is is so large that it, it you know it, it, the cloud the movement to the cloud is going to be very deflationary for them. So every time somebody moves an application to the cloud, they will definitely lose a database uh, license sale opportunity or a maintenance contract. So that's their primary issue. And I think they you know obviously they haven't they've always been the consolidator, but I do think that they're going to have to reorganize and. Streamline, streamline that organization, and I think if they thought it all the way through, I think it would make you know the most sense to separate the applications business, which you know has some cl uh, high growth cloud names in it like NetSuite and so forth, and then the database business can you know can compete uh, uh, in and of itself and by itself independently. And I think there's sort of a negative synergy now by having those two uh, parts of the business uh, combined. Okay, uh, we got to leave the conversation there, John and Dan. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. No, happy holidays. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Still to come this morning, a top technician tells us what the charts are foreshadowing about investing in 2020. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box right here on CNBC. Christmas tree at the Christmas party When I lost my sight. How's work? If you're not loving your job and you're getting those Sunday blues, now's the time to make a change. With a LinkedIn app, it's now easier to find and land the job meant for you. There are millions of jobs on offer, and the LinkedIn app helps you hear about them first. Research shows applying within the first 10 minutes increases your chances of hearing back by up to four times. Stay in the know and grow your career. Download the free LinkedIn app today. At Asda this Christmas, our whole basted turkey is just £4 a kilo, and our grower selection vegetables are only 20p per pack. Get a broccoli, one kilogram of carrots and 500 grams of parsnips or sprouts. Asda, let's make Christmas extra special. Selected stores subject to availability. Broccoli, 360 grams, ends 26th of December. With 2020 on the horizon, TuneIn continues looking back at the stories that shaped the 2010s. In 2010, the passing of the Affordable Care Act brings Obamacare to millions of uninsured Americans. In 2015, a ruling by Supreme Court legalizes same-sex marriage across the country. And in 2018, millions of students skip school to protest for stronger gun control in the March for Our Lives. Search news on TuneIn to be listening when the next decade's big headlines break. Heading for the end, scores! On the goal! Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. As we play out the 2010s, TuneIn's looking back at the music trends that defined the decade. That's why I need a one dance. The 2010s was the decade of the surprise album drop. Yeah, where artists from Beyonce, Drake, and Frank Ocean to Radiohead, U2, and the late David Bowie skipped the traditional promotion cycle to bring their music directly to fans with little to no warning. Keep listening to tune in for more trends of the 2010s. Far wing elevates triple bucket. The war of the crowd. The shot clock ticks down. Will the ball go in? The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. And the replays just don't cut. The sideline, the man fleet for three. Tune in Premium brings you every minute of the NBA season streaming live, so you can be there when it matters most. Hear it now. Hear it live on TuneIn. I'm faking the lane. Turnaround jumper from eight feet is good on Search the right NBA plus. today to start listening. Stocks have been rallying into the end of this year, but do you remember what happened last year on Christmas Eve? Yeah, it was a little bit of a scary time. Check this out. Since that drop, you're seeing just the end of it right there. Check out what has happened. The S&P is up more than 33%, I think actually 36% or even a little more. Joining us right now with a technical look at the markets is Chris Verone. He's partner and head of technical analysis at Strategus Securities. Also our guest host, Joe Lavornia, is here too. Uh, 
Chris, you see more bullish signals, even given the gains that we've seen since last Christmas Eve? Yeah, I think what's remarkable is when you look at this business, price tends to lead data. And when we look at all the macro charts right now, whether it's steepening yield curves in U.S., in Germany, in Aussie, whether it's crude near a 52-week high, copper breaking out, I think this spells better growth in 2020. And I think the question is, yes, the market's up a lot off the low, but most markets around the world really haven't made a lot of progress over two years. So I think it's early to fade this. Let's just put that for people who don't follow these charts frequently. Yeah. You look at things like oil and at crude because those markets would tend to figure out if demand's going to be up or down from here, right? Yeah, like I think they're significant in terms of global demand. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the macro pictures. The industrials, expoing, have actually been really good. The material stocks have started to firm. Semis have been leadership all year. So these conditional inputs that we look to for signal on whether growth is getting better or getting worse, I think point to an improvement in 2020. 20 versus 19. And that's exactly, that's, I, I couldn't agree more with, with, with what Chris is saying, and Tom and I were talking about this offline, about macro data lagging, yeah. that uh, there are some figures that are worthwhile, but the thing is the markets will have a way of endogen, endogenously, they're basically creating the wealth and the opportunities, and the financial conditions are so supportive that if you have high equity prices, a market that's under-owned, curve is steepening, it's good for financials, industrial, sure. cyclicals, and you actually get the better growth. So I, I, I couldn't agree with, yeah, you're, you're spot on. Well, we'll see. I, I think the parts of the world that in many respects have been most hated all decade, European banks, Japanese stocks, are actually those that are getting better here. I think investors ought to look to them next year as areas of leadership. What, what does that mean? You, you mentioned that a lot of these markets, a lot of these areas, yeah. like you just mentioned, haven't seen the gains to this point. What does that mean for a market like the U.S. equities market that has seen a lot of gains? Well, I think it's a question of where leadership is going to come from next year. One of the things we did, we look at the German PMI. When a German PMI is 40 or below, you want to be buying every European stock you can find. It it's can't a, get any worse. It can't get worse. What's can't the worst that happens? It goes from 40 to 38. Who cares at that point? So... Where do you have that? You have that in Hong Kong, you have it in Germany, you have it in Australia. Places that have been neglected over the last number of years, I think is where some of the gains in 2020 will be found. Chris, I'm officially nervous. We've been on air now for three hours. Nobody's had yeah. any it's, pessimistic views. It's just yeah, been sure. a chorus of and, and nothing can go wrong. Exactly. Rates are going to increase. Rates are going to stay stable. We're not going to have any big geopolitical issues. The S&P is going to go up another 10% next year. What could go wrong? Is positioning as mature as people are talking right now. I think that's that the big mean? question. It, I think what it means, if you look at the positioning data, do people own the right stuff? I think there's signs of excess in low vol stocks, <clears throat> in yield stocks. Are there really signs of excess in the risk on corners of the market? Triple C's, high yield, but so, not equities. So it's this debate of where's positioning excessive. If you look at the fund flows this year, right. the sectors with the most flows, staples, utilities, telcos. That is not the risk on positioning that gets us worried. I recognize in the very short term here, put calls are very low. I think that can be a tactical risk. But let's not confuse a correction or a pause with a top. Most markets around the world are in good technical standing. I think trends have improved. And I think the macro charts are getting better. A, year, a year ago on this set, the markets were going to hell yeah. and everyone came on and said, things are terrible. 2019 is going to be a lousy year. Today feels like the opposite, which, which makes me nervous. But it's the Fed pivot, though, Tom. That's the thing. I mean, these guys, gals, made such a big mistake last year by tightening rates, letting that balance sheet roll off, and now you've got the exact opposite. They're basically doing QE. They don't admit it. Rates are low. Curve is steeper. And the positioning, uh, as Chris was saying, is really on really the, risk, the risky type of names. You know, I, I also think you know, the S&P is up 27 or 28 this year, right? When you've looked historically, that's a first percentile type year. When you look at forward returns following that, they're actually better than you would expect. They're better than the historical average. I recognize it's an election year. You'll get a correction at some point. I don't want to confuse a correction with the end of this bull market. I don't believe this bull market's well, 10 years old. So let's I've, ask you an election question. Predicted has uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, 20% chance combined of being the next president of the United States. If it looks like they're going to win the nomination come March, sure. April, May, what does that mean for it you? It means you buy March vol and you sell November vol, right? If, something, if you're going to get a bad election outcome in November, <clears throat> the market's going to figure it out long before me or you, and it's going to press it in but a lot. But that's what I mean. If, if there is going to be a bad thing come, that comes, 
for, sure. for the markets, the markets will figure it out first. What should investors be watching to see, like, oh boy? How, I think how the how price signals good? are going to tell us, right? If we're going to get a very adverse outcome, we're going to start to see things like discretionary rollback over, copper rollback over. If this is truly about growth weakening in you'll 2021, curve you'll curve flatten again. And I think until we get those price signals, because it was the price signals all this year that led the data. So until that reverses, I'm reluctant to take the other side here yet. Again, put calls are low. You get a pause or consolidation. But the signs of a Final major Monday. pop I don't think are in place. What, uh, if, if you're looking at a market that you think will be the best, you mentioned some of these European yeah. banks. What, what else do you think will be the markets that really take off or the areas that really take off? Next? I love Japan here. Uh, Nikkei has been neglected for three decades. I think it's improving. You have the most stocks above their 200-day right now in the topics than you've had in about four or five years. When participation expands, it's bullish. The Japanese banks have also started to turn. The Japanese consumer and industrial stocks have all turned. I think that is a neglected area of the world. We surveyed about 700 investors last week what market they thought would be best over the next year. Japan was last on that list. So I think you have sentiment uh, on your side there as well. So what are you kind of watching out for? What would be the bump in the road as far as you're concerned? GDP 3%, unemployment at 3%, wages moving up toward 4 and the Fed going, oh my God. Raising. Raising. Well, I don't think they're going to raise, uh, but you get that fear back in the market where the Fed's going to take the liquidity. I'll make it harder for you. I'll make it harder for you. Let's say you're right and we get close to the election, and and then Jay Powell has to decide whether he was going to raise rates right at a time where the president's going to be screaming to go the opposite way. If the Fed's going to hike, it's going to be... You're saying not before... I I mean, my fear on the Fed is is spring when it's clear that some of the things Chris was talking about and the data that I'm projecting turns, it'll be the spring summer. Spring they're summer. not going to move. They're, they're not going to be raising rates in October, November the next year. Right, but spring, I'm saying this spring, yeah, this I, summer. Can I okay. just, wait, let me break in very quickly. Boeing has been halted for news pending. I don't know what that news is, but it's been halted for the last couple of minutes. I'm just taking a look at it right now. We are about out of time for the session, so Squawk on the Street will pick this up in just a moment, but let's take a look at shares of Boeing. It looks like they mm. are halted. It's, uh, the official word is that they are halted due to news pending. Don't know what that news is. Don't know if they've heard anything else from the FAA. There has been lots of speculation about the leadership there. Uh, we are out of time, but Squawk on the Street will pick this up right now. Gentlemen, thank you all for being thank you. here. Happy holidays, folks. Sure. Becky, yeah, happy happy holidays. Make sure you join us tomorrow. We're going to hand it to Squawk on the Street right now and wait for the Boeing news. Squawk on the Street. I'm Carl Kingston here with David Faber of the New York Stock Exchange. Kramer has the morning off this hour. Jim Stewart, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist with the New York Times, a CNBC contributor, the author of Deep State, Trump, the FBI, and the Rule of Law is with us for the hour. It's great to have you, Jim. Good. Good uh, to be here. Futures are up on a holiday shortened week. Closed Wednesday, obviously, for Christmas. A shortened session tomorrow, and we are going to watch this news, whatever it is, as it is halted uh, currently for news pending. Comes on the heels, guys, of this front page story in the Times today, uh, titled Boeing's Leader Deepens a Crisis, um, which basically says a couple different things. One is that he was dressed down by the FAA chief earlier in the year, uh, told not to ask for any favors, and says that the halt of production of the MAX, in their words, is one of the most consequential decisions in the company's 103-year history. We don't know what this news is, Jim, but it probably wouldn't surprise many people if it involved Muhlenberg's tenure. No, I don't think so. I mean, first of all, that story that reported uh, tensions between him and the the head of the FAA, I mean, his top priority has got to be getting along with, charming, and sharing, I mean, totally transparent with the regulators. I would have thought that would have been crystal clear the day of the first crash. So how did it reach that juncture where he's, I mean, it's shocking to me that one of the things he says is, well, don't ask for any favors. Well, was he expecting him to ask favors? That is not a good situation to be in. And that's just one small way, part of the way this crisis has been handled for the last year, which, I mean, will be a business school textbook study. But one thing that has always struck me about this, the crisis management, the mantra I always heard was under-promise and over-deliver. And what has Boeing and Muhlenberg done? They have done the opposite from almost the very beginning 
over-promising and under-delivering. I mean, more, more, more times than at this point I could even Oh, add. absolutely. And striking the comments by Gary Kelly, uh, Southwest CEO, who's been on air, air critical of uh, the process here, talked about per perhaps looking at Airbus airplanes in the future, but says uh, that the promises Boeing made in the spring, going back to April, that the return of the MAX was not a matter of months but weeks, and said that that overconfidence on the manufacturer's part really created havoc within his airline. And him going on the record is probably not a, not a mistake. No, uh, it, it is not. And as you said, we talked directly to Mr. Kelly about his frustration at this point. And you know, you've had, as you again, Carl, these these stories both in the Journal and the Times, sort of detailing uh, the Journal story, very very specific in all the different uh, ins and outs of what's happened at Boeing. Uh, you know. I think it's safe to assume that Mr. Mullenberg will no longer be the CEO of this company. Uh, I guess I'll keep that in the realm of speculation based on what I know at this point, but I would say that it's very much informed speculation. But let's wait and see what the, what the, uh, what the news actually is. We will get it. Uh, my, my question would be certainly who would take over for Mr. Mullenberg. Will Mr. Calhoun, who really has been in many ways, as it's been described to me of late, um, been running the company, lack of a better term, or certainly very much involved in the day-to-day -day at this point as the, as the chairman of the board. Will he just add that, or are they going to have somebody else? Um, but I think it's safe to say that, um, that we can expect Mr. Mullenberg will no longer be the CEO of the company. Well, one of the things that surprised me about this is not just that there was kind of a political failure. I mean, I've heard Mullenberg described as more of, of a technocrat, a, a kind of a, you know, nuts and bolts kind of guy. So maybe you could imagine he wouldn't be that savvy to the politics of this, the public relations part of it. But what about the engineering? This is what has completely baffled me. I mean, the old 737 flew for decades without any significant problems. So they put this software thing on there that, you know, I guess it's supposed to be a safety feature. It causes two crashes. They say, oh, this is no big deal. We'll just fix the software. Why didn't we get a better understanding of, first of all, what was this device to begin with? How did it change the old system? How valuable is it? Nobody has even told me, why don't they just go back to the old thing? Take this thing off. It, I mean, people weren't, I don't think there were any crashes because of this. But in any event, we never got any explanation of this. And kind of waving it off like it's no big deal, that's a huge engineering failure. And that's what has dismayed me, I think, the most about Boeing throughout this crisis. Do we think uh, the Starliner uh, botched mission to the ISS, of course, just landed in New Mexico uh, in what they called a bullseye landing. Um, but do you think that was compounding the problems from Mullenberg? Because they've already let go of the head of their commercial aircraft division. David says uh, Calhoun's in there running things operationally, at least as a chairman, right? Haven't they made enough management moves or, or not? Well, I, you know, I can't, I can't speak to the space thing. I mean, it's certainly...